Good, okay. Uh, it's 9.30 at my clock. I think we should start. Um, I remind you this meeting is being recorded and then will be available, in fact, I think uh, also on YouTube uh, later in the week for everybody else uh, to visit, to look at. Um, I would like to invite the speakers to unmute their microphone and microphone and switch on the camera when they are um, when it's their their turn and to keep it off and with the microphone muted when they are not uh, speaking just to save some bandwidth. Um, I I'm not sure I know whether and how we are going to get uh, questions, but uh, I mean, for sure, among ourselves within this webinar, we we can ask each other a question and then I see whether I get some more. But so yeah. without further ado, I think we can start really unless, unless there is any last minute uh, ad announcement from the organizers. So if not, let, let's get started. Uh, we have this morning, we are here at the parallel special session on the first result from SRG and its two scientific instruments, the Michael Pavlinsky Arctic Sea and Irosita X-ray telescopes. Maybe I can very quickly share my screen so that you can see the program today. We have six talks, two review talks from uh, Professor Alexander Lutovinov from ICI in Moscow about the highlights from Michael Pavlinsky Arctic Sea. And then uh, a review talk from Dr. Ezra Bulbul from MP on uh, Erosita first look at galaxy groups and clusters, followed by four contributed talks. One from Dr. Tanimura on the prospect from WIM detection in the cosmic web uh, by SRG Rosita. One by Ricardo Codia with uh, about the uh, X-ray blast from two present uh, previously quiescent galaxy, a new discovery from Erosita. Uh, Dr. Chandra Imaitra will tell us about uh, the Magellanic cloud observation uh, uh, with Erosita and the X-ray observation of supernova 1987A. And finally, uh, Dr. Gabriele Ponti will tell us about uh, the galactic center and the galactic outflows and the view from XMM and Erosita. Okay, so I think we can start with our first uh, speaker, uh, Professor Lutovinov from ICI, who will tell us about the first result from Michael Pavlinsky Arctic Sea. Sasha. Yeah, Andre, thank you very much. Uh, I will try to make the share screen. Mm -hmm. ah, is, is it okay? Is it okay? Yes, looks good. You Look, can go ahead. Okay. okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for Andrea for organizing such important session, taking into account our yesterday awarding ceremony for the SRG for the outstanding uh, uh, map of the galaxy or, or of the universe. And uh, I would like briefly talk about the Arctic Sea Telescope and some description of these telescopes and first uh, results, highlights from the uh, from this telescope, and which I hope will be apparent in next uh, week uh, in the Astro page. So first of all, I would like to pay some tribute uh, to uh, my friend, my mentor friend, and our leaders, Mikhail Pavlinsky, who was a PI for the Arctic Sea Telescope and QI for the SRG Observatory. Definitely, Mikhail made a decisive contribution to successful realization of the project in general and creation of Russia the modern school space instrumentation. And uh, unfortunately, he uh, left us last year and uh, our, uh, they decided uh, to name the Arctic Sea Telescope after the Mikhail Paulinsky, the Mikhail Paulinsky Arctic Sea Telescope. And this uh, photo of Mikhail, uh, many of us uh, well known, it uh, was a very nice guy and uh, really personally my friend. And this uh, telescope, uh, our beautiful instrument, it's uh, the first uh, focusing teles X-ray telescope in Russia, which was produced here. And uh, this is uh, the main part of the telescope, it's a mirror system, detector systems, uh, which uh, I will uh, briefly present uh, later. 
And uh, this is a collaboration, uh, just a general collaboration in the SFG project, but still several lines uh, re have a relation to the, uh, the project in general and also for the uh, Arctic Sea Telescope as well. It's a Space Research Institute is the head uh, scientific institute in Russia on this project. The Chilavashkin Association produced the platform, a very nice platform navigator for the, uh, for the observatory. And uh, uh, our uh, uh, Russian Federal Nuclear Center in Sarov and Marshall Space Flight Center, uh, NASA in, uh, in the USA, it's uh, uh, main uh, our partners in production of the Arctic Sea Telescopes and the other institutes related to the, our friends, our German friends, it's a collaboration of the Erasita telescope and bo bo uh, definitely it's an important role to play here at the Roscosmos, our space agency and the DLR's German space agency who finance and support this project. So this uh, general view of uh, the observatory you see here it's uh, this uh, navigator platform here and uh, both telescopes it's the uh, Arctic Sea and Erasita it's uh, the picture was made at the Lauchkin Association uh, as I correctly remember, in the February 2019, just before the flight to the Baikonur, uh, and you see here it's already solar panels uh, attached, and uh, both telescopes are ready uh, to the work in the space. So uh, both instruments uh, complement each other, and there is the work in the uh, soft energy band. You see uh, yesterday probably, and previously that's nice pictures, and I hope you see it during the next presentations. And Arctic Sea complementar. Uh, the uh, soft X-ray instrument Erasita uh, working in the harder band from the 4 kV and uh, both telescopes have the K properties. It's a large area with a large field of view, the so-called uh, grasp, which allowed uh, both of them to make the uh, uh, survey or the all sky survey with the very high sensitivity in the soft and hard X-ray band. You see here is a comparison of the on-axis effective area of Erasita and Arctic C, and uh, approximately the, around the 6 kV, uh, Arctic C started to be more, have a more effective area and more sensitive uh, than the Erasita in working up to the 30 kV. So it's a very nice observatory, very nice instruments, which are working together uh, for the, uh, to obtain the great science. So this uh, uh, general view, the schematic uh, view of the Arctic Sea Telescope, it uh, includes seven uh, uh, modules with the seven, seven mirror systems on the optical bench plane and uh, seven uh, detectors units with collimators and cooling pipes at the distance approximately 2.7 meters from the, uh, from the top with the focal uh, length is about 2.7 meters. It's uh, several pictures of uh, the flight model of uh, Arctic Sea. See here, it's uh, seven, again, seven uh, mirror systems. Each of them includes 28 shells. And uh, these are pictures from the Sarov. Then the, this, uh, this uh, mirror system was pro produced. Um, uh, to accelerate our work, uh, we make the two branch of our uh, development of our mirror systems. One of them was produced in Russia in the Federal Center it's for qualification model of Arctic Sea. It's in parallel, our colleagues from the Marshall Space Flight Center make uh, their own uh, mirror systems, which uh, allow us to save several years uh, for, uh, for the production of the telescopes as uh, they start into some tests with the uh, qualification model, then the flight models, uh, mirror systems continue to produce. So this is some characteristics of our mirror systems at the flight model. As I say, they have the Marshall Space Flight Center mirror systems, which are slightly better uh, than the Sarov ones. And these are the characteristics. We have the very nice on-axis angular resolution, about 35 arc seconds. And uh, also they have the mirror coating materials like iridium to improve the quality of uh, our reflection at the high energy. So uh, thanks to the uh, length of the shell about 60 centimeters and the uh, focal length is 2.7 meters, they can ability uh, work up to the 30 kV. So another key point of our instruments, it's a detector that is fully uh, developed and created at the Space Research Institute. It's uh, the Cadmi Telluride uh, Manufacturer Acrylate Crystals, which have uh, double side strip detectors. 
Uh, they have the 48 by 48 strips on both sides of the detector, which allow us to make the quite good uh, 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 special resolution. And they also had a very good uh, uh, timing resolutions at that time, formally 0 0.7 millisecond, but the timing resolution is uh, 23 microseconds. So it's allow us work with the very quick uh, uh, events in the space. Uh, uh, including the millisecond pulses. You see here the pictures from our institute and the, uh, our colleagues under leadership of Vasily Levin uh, assembling the, the flight model detects. So this is a final uh, assembling of the telescope of the Sarov. You see there's a uh, huge facilities uh, which uh, uh, have been for Lazar Institute uh, to create and to use to, uh, this, uh, uh, this instrument. So as uh, in the uh, any uh, in the history of any instruments, there is uh, some key points, and the first of uh, such points after the launch is the first light and first light of Arctic Sea we obtained on the July uh, 13 uh, on the 20, 19, uh, 2019 at uh, around the uh, half past uh, six, uh, half past four uh, p.m. Uh, uh, UTC. You see, it's uh, the time fixed this moment and this picture of uh, part of our Arctic Sea team and Mikhail Pavlinsky obtained the sample regulations from uh, colleagues with the very nice picture obtained with the seven models of uh, these telescopes. Then they observed the very famous uh, Pulsar Centaurus X3. It's uh, first, uh, uh, first pulsating sources which was discarded with Uhuru. So this is uh, quite symbolically. Uh, that uh, they choose it uh, for the first light for Arctic Sea. You see here seven models, seven uh, uh, seven images of uh, the Arctic Sea, and nice signals with the period of 4.8 seconds uh, from these telescopes. This is some key uh, dates from the, our working uh, plan. It's uh, they had the HAL PV phase up to December 19. In the December 19, they started first uh, sky survey. And uh, 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 they finished uh, the first uh, all sky survey in the uh, June 2020 and continue to work with the second and third all sky survey now. So I, uh, I will came to the, uh, to the um, results. Uh, this is a map of the obtained during the one year all sky survey with Arctic Sea during the first two surveys. Uh, at this moment, the, the final stage of the catalog and uh, paper, which I hope will uh, submit it in this week and appear in the Astro Pension next week, uh, in the frame of the, our special issue early data release from the Erosita and Arctic Sea telescopes. And at this moment, they detect uh, around uh, 900 sources in the based uh, energy band for 12 kV. And uh, they expect about uh, five to seven uh, percent of the uh, false sources here. It's uh, normally, I think. And uh, they expect, taking into account the continuation of our work in the all sky surveys, uh, to detect probably four or five thousand sources uh, till the end of the four years of sky survey. Then, uh, uh, thus, uh, obtaining the most uh, uh, detailed and most uh, sensitive map in the hard X-ray rays of the universe. So at this moment, they already found dozens of absorbed sources which uh, are poor or not detected in the soft X-rays, and uh, they uh, found some variability on the, scale, uh, on the time scale of half year for several of them, and this uh, uh, analysis and the progress. And why hard X-ray are important, it's uh, quite known. But nevertheless, I show here the, the two examples of such sources. First of all, this uh, extra galactic, uh, these uh, sources that absorb AGMs and depending on the angle of view, for example, from the uh, uh, black to red and to blue arrows, you will see there's a different spectra uh, of uh, these sources on the, on the right side, you see the black and uh, uh, magenta and uh, blue ones. You see that uh, here that uh, the drastical disappearance of the source in the soft X-rays. At the same time, the source is nicely detected in hard X-rays. The same situation can be observed for the galactic sources. And here you see that uh, some uh, high mass X-ray binary system, then the compact object like the, the neutron stars are deeply uh, inside of the 
uh, of the dense stellar wheat like inside the open and uh, this uh, the right side you see the picture of the integral and the RSTE for some of such absorbed source and then practically no signals below the 10 keV but it's a nice very nice signal very strong signal in the hard x-ray so and this example of uh, one of such shows is discovered with the Arctic sea uh, at this moment they have the several such sources and this probably one of the best examples you see for the detection in the hard x-rays these are blue points and only upper limits from the erosita due to very high absorption more than 10 to the 33 and the in the region of localization we found some candidate galaxy make the observations with our rtt uh, 1.5 meters telescopes and found that this is a safer two galaxy at the distance uh, about uh, 200 megaparsecs and very, very absorbed system. Uh, now it's uh, published already and uh, our young colleagues, uh, Igor Zaznobin, leader on this paper, it's number of papers and in this work, then the people starting to uh, unveil the nature of such absorbed sources. Uh, another advantage of the observatory in general uh, is the possibility not to uh, uh, make the all sky surveys, but also make observations of some uh, extended sources like the uh, origins, like the galactic centers or the uh, clusters of galaxies within the scanning mode. It's an important thing is uh, uh, in line with the hard, uh, in line with the uh, quite high uh, large field of view, uh, this mode allowed uh, to cover such extended regions or extended sources with the very uniform exposure to obtain uh, uh, the images and make the other analysis, which are not possible, for example, for uh, for the new star, which uh, work also in hard X-rays. So it allowed us to make the, some galactic plane and deep surveys of the galactic center during KLPV phase with the very uh, uniform and smooth exposure and found here it's about 150 sources and this is some zoom uh, to the galactic center and the zoom to the galactic center you see here this is a number of the point sources as well as diffuse emission and uh, this is a very nice example of two uh, neutron stars uh, which located not far away from uh, galactic center with uh, both the sources is uh, busters and uh, for from uh, several uh, from one of the, or both of them they detected several thermal nuclear bars. So at this moment in this uh, region they detect 115 sources and approximately 40 sources are new ones. And uh, I, 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 as I say, in line with the, the general catalog, this uh, this catalog also should appear next week in the page. So uh, uh, extended sources uh, observed with Arctic Sea and hard X-rays are quite important targets for us as uh, the, for the first time they can obtain uh, the detailed hard X-ray maps of the clusters of galaxies which have a quite a large uh, size which not possible as I say to make with the new star for example the new star have the several pointing observations to cover which should uh, lead to the some problems with the uniformity of exposure etc cetera, etc cetera. But here the, you see that's a first map and hard X-rays of the coma clusters. Now they are working uh, hardly on this analysis and they see the very nice signal up to the 20 TV and now they work on the, this analysis. Uh, another uh, extended source which was observed in the Arctic Sea and they obtained a quite nice picture is uh, the supernova remnants. You see here it's one of them, it's a uniform hard X-ray map of such source. So, uh, uh, they had a very good uh, uh, energy uh, coverage of uh, from the 4 to the 30 kV. You see here some example of the bright uh, sources, uh, which was uh, nicely detected up to 30 kV with the Arctic Sea. They had the regular calibration uh, uh, every two months of uh, our instruments, and they see that it's very stable situation with uh, the energy uh, scale. So uh, this is one of the examples of such analysis. You see here it's uh, the integral uh, or uh, Arctic Sea detect uh, these uh, sources in the very, very low states and triggered uh, the follow-up observation with new stars, which allowed to us to uh, first time obtain uh, the uh, broadband spectrum uh, uh, in the hard, uh, broadband spectrum of these sources and detect the pulsation in such low states. Uh, as I said, they had a very nice timing uh, capabilities. 
And you see here uh, uh, the example of several milliseconds pulsars. And previously, I shown the pulsar with the period about uh, around 100 seconds. And uh, for the millisecond pulsars, uh, we observed uh, these sources uh, with diff uh, uh, four orders of magnitude of uh, difference of intensity, and we can detect pulsation up to 60 milliseconds, uh, uh, up to 60 milliseconds. So, and definitely they uh, can observe the sources with the higher periods. So quite nice that now the working on this and uh, observation of these uh, pulsars help us uh, to improve the timing scale of the uh, of the observatory and make the, some improvement to the barycentric uh, correction. So, and final point of my presentation is uh, uh, transients observed with Arctic Sea as a we know that uh, the sky is variable, and uh, every day they observed approximately 1% of the sky. It's not so high, like, for example, Maxi or Bat, but, uh, but they reach down uh, luminosity up uh, uh, 10 to the minus 11. And uh, in this diagram, uh, daily observed past the sky sensitivity, you see the quite nice point for the Arctic Sea. So uh, they had a quite good localization on 20. Uh, arc seconds and uh, fast response approximately one to hours after downlink. So this drive to provide rapid alerts, new interesting uh, events uh, could be crucial for studied fast rise stage of the XRBs, transients, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, in the terms of the luminosity and distances, they cover uh, uh, significant part of our galaxy, uh, practically all our galaxy up to luminosity two times 10 to the 35. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the bulge and the galactic center up to the 10 to the 35 Earth per second up to the, the distance of the 10 kiloparsecs. So it leads uh, for some discoveries and main cage not so bright, but not so frequent X-ray transients. But nevertheless, uh, during the first 18 months of the survey, they found at least two new uh, high mass X-ray binaries. I think uh, now they found several more. Two new symbiotic systems, new MEC procurators, several new novel like CVs or candidate such sources. We discovered new outputs of historical microclasers of other known sources. Uh, they found the GRBs after glow NIST GRBs, and that also several GRBs uh, they detected through the side shield. So, several examples. I have five minutes, I think. Yes. Uh, and uh, these are some examples of the Arctic Sea transients. Uh, the first one, it's a very short-lived transients detected only in one scan during approximately 14 seconds and no source before and after with a four-hour uh, span. But uh, this source was also detected with Erosita and they submitted two telegrams here. It's a Erosita de de detected source, I don't remember exactly, after, in, in one scan after this very low luminosity. And uh, they discussed these sources with our colleagues uh, from Caltech uh, several months later. And they uh, make the, some observations, follow-up observations of the source. And uh, uh, they think that these are missed GRBs of the afterglow of the GRB. It's a quite interesting point. Another- uh, yeah, Five minutes now, Sasha. Yeah, 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 yeah. OK, OK, right. I, 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 yeah. Uh, another uh, in, another quite uh, important discovery of the Arctic Sea. It's uh, the source with this name. Uh, uh, it was discovered here. You see it's, uh, the green line here. It's, uh, and uh, comparis, as I previously shown, this in comparison with Maxi, who uh, started to observe these sources, uh, started to detect the source, significantly detect the source several months later. They reported about its discovery here. This leads to the very, uh, very uh, extended uh, follow-up campaign to observe the sources in different uh, energy bands, in the optical, in the X-rays. You see here a number of new star observations of the Swift XRT started to observe the source. And uh, many observations was in the infrared, in the optic, in the radio. And people uh, found that uh, this is a new microquasar in our galaxy with very unusual uh, relation between uh, uh, optical and uh, X-ray luminosity. And uh, this uh, already several papers already published about these sources. And now Ilya Mireminsky uh, wrote with, uh, the general paper about this source and taking into account all the available data, uh, also available uh, obtained with the integral. If you see here, it's a 
broadband, uh, very, uh, very unusual broadband spectrum of this source. Uh, another important things, I think uh, the uh, SRG and uh, in general and Arctic Sea and Terrazita will uh, make a decisive contribution uh, to the discovery of uh, the faint uh, uh, high mass X-ray binaries in our galaxy and uh, they can complete the population of uh, faint X-ray pulses. I show here uh, two examples of such sources which was discovered in collaboration with our colleagues uh, uh, from the Erosita team, from German team. And it's a very long period pulsation with pulsars. Uh, it, uh, one of them already published, the next one appears in the next week. And uh, here you see that nice spectrum obtained from the Keck telescope uh, for the first uh, sources. You see a very nice H alpha line and several other emission lines which show definitely uh, uh, point to the B nature of these sources. And finally, uh, they also can observe, uh, as I say, that the GRBs or GRB afterglow, it's uh, some example of such sources. They also can, uh, uh, can some, make the, some contribution for the uh, follow-up observations or detections or not detection of the gamma of gravitational wave events after the uh, new run of the LIGO Virgo will start at this example of, of, for uh, one of such events in the 2020. And as I say, uh, we detect several very uh, bright uh, gamma ray bursts through the side shield. You see here it's, uh, the comparison between our light curve and light curve from Conus Wind. This is some delay, it's uh, connected with the different position in the, in the solar system of these instruments, which allowed us to uh, jointly work with the interplanetary network for the uh, localization of such sources. So thank you for your attention. I will stop. Thank you very much, Sasha. Perfectly on time. In fact, we have uh, a, minute, a few minutes for, for questions. So uh, I would then ask everybody, if you have a question, you can raise your hand in the reactions. Uh, yeah, uh, Idetek, Idek. Yeah, uh, just uh, my curiosity, uh, you show the image uh, around the galactic center and the zoom in and you show two uh, neutron stars. Is this really a binary or just the nearby neutron stars? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, uh, this, uh, this uh, binary systems in uh, low mass X-ray binaries. Uh, oh, this one. Yeah. This, uh, from the low mass X-ray binaries and some uh, saving some matter on uh, the surface and uh, from time to time, it's a thermonuclear bar that appears on the uh, surface uh, during the 10 or 50 seconds. Okay, thank you. It's fine. Thank you. Yeah. More questions? Well, I, I, I maybe I, I, I have one or two. Um, okay. Have you detected any source above 12, 12 kV only, super hard sources, or is your sensitivity, or, or do you need, I mean, is your sensitivity and, and depth not sufficient yet? Uh, uh, in the old sky survey, no. Okay. Uh, for the galactic center, they have uh, one or two candidates, but I'm not sure that this. Uh, can you remind me, maybe you said it, I forgot, how deep is this galactic center? What's the exposure? Uh, typical exposure? I, 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 <laughs> I will see it in just a second. It was uh, several times higher. It's, it depends from the, just, just a second. Yeah. Just, I will give you uh, the exact numbers. I, I don't exactly remember. I don't, I, we, we can do it also offline. Don't we? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I said uh, just, just, just a second. I will open uh, the. I will open the paper. <laughs> sure, it's depending. Uh, uh, it's uh, not uh, fully uniform. As a, it's the main point. Is uh, some points was uh, uh, scanned several times, and some of the so so so. Okay, okay. Uh, that uh, the very small regions was uh, covered with sensitivity up to 10 to minus uh, 13, but uh, more or less, uh, okay, the total, uh, total area is about uh, 16, uh, 17 degrees. 
and uh, the approximately half of this area was covered with the sensitivity uh, better than the 10 to the minus 12. Okay, thank you. I see there is another question from yeah. Piero. Is that uh, mm -hmm. Hi. Piero. Um, just a curiosity, I was wondering whether you have handy a spectrum of the, of the comma cluster observations. <laughs> Uh, yes, they had the spectrum of coma cluster, but I'm not sure here. It's uh, it's just in the in the work. Okay. In Thank progress. <laughs> Sorry, Very nice. I, I can yeah. show only picture at the moment, but uh, uh, as a uh, main uh, no, not problems, but main uh, challenge here it's uh, uh, exactly uh, take into account some uh, instrumental um, features to correctly obtained, uh, uh, obtained the fluxes for the extended sources at the high energy. It's uh, quite, it's, it's, they need to make the very uh, thin calibration. Sure, okay, very nice results, thank you. I mean, for, 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 for your curiosity, we also, I mean, they also, I can tell you that some more observation of Abel 3266 were done with Arctic Sea very recently just to help yeah. with the calibration of the spectrum yeah. of the extended yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I show the picture of one of the cluster in, uh, in the presentation. And uh, I, I, now they are in touch with uh, our German colleagues to make the cross calibration to, uh, for the big extended source. Yeah, you're right. Okay, so uh, is there, if there are no more questions, we can thank uh, again uh, Alexander for his very nice presentation and move uh, to our next speaker, Dr. Ezra Bulbul from MPE, who will tell us about the first Erosita results on groups and clusters. All right, I'm sharing my screen and should be able to see now. Looks good, yeah. Okay, great. Oh, okay, thank you, Andrea, very much for um, organizing this session, and thank you all for being here. I'll tell you a little bit about what we have observed with Erosita on galaxy clusters um, and groups. Um, since we're going to be talking about galaxy clusters today, I would like to introduce what these objects are first. So if we go way back in time um, in, the, in the early universe, um, in the density field, we used to see these fluctuations. And these fluctuations where they are basically collapse on themselves and we realize this and forms the astronomical structures that we see today. And clusters of galaxies are one of those objects. And in fact, they are formed from the largest density peaks in the universe. And they are located in this um, connecting knots of cosmic web, basically, and that they, they, they are um, these basically white uh, knots where you see the connect uh, the filaments connect with each other. Um, they are basically not variable in a sense that uh, what Sasha was talking about earlier. They don't vary from day to day um, or month to month, but they vary in giga year time scales. So they grow with time um, through accretion through these filaments that you see over here. And because they form from the largest density peaks in the universe, their number density and the distribution in the sky is a good cosmo cosmology probe. So we can basically constrain cosmological parameters using their sheer number in the sky. Um, if you look at these objects, majority of their mass is in dark matter and this dark matter basically holds all the material within the cluster. What we are talking about here is that um, they're composed of galaxies. So these are member galaxies that you see in optical light. Um, and a rich cluster can contain about the thousands of them. And so these galaxies are confined with dark matter, but they only constitute only a few percent of their mass in fraction. And the gas, intracluster gas, it's hot plasma. The temperature is 10 to the 8 Kelvin or so. Um, is also present in, this, uh, in these objects. And also that gas is confined with dark matter 
potential. And uh, the, the gas, in fact, that plasma constitutes about 13% of their mass, and the remaining 85% of their mass is in dark matter. And this gas is very hot and dilute at these temperatures and densities. It emits primarily through X-rays, through Bremsstrahlung. And that's how we find them, in fact. Um, and Eurozita finds these clusters through X-ray emission through Bremsstrahlung. And the gas is made up of mostly primordial uh, material like hydrogen and helium coming from the formation of the uh, Big Bang, et cetera, after the Big Bang. Um, and, but then you observe the metals in this gas and they account for up to the 1% of the gas mass. Um, and these metals basically enter to the intercluster medium through galactic bin supernova explosions. And they are mostly formed in, in galaxies and stars and they are pushed into the uh, intercluster medium through these processes. So these are what we're gonna talk about today, but let me take you back to E. Rosita and then briefly mention what E. Rosita is. You have probably heard from Rashid yesterday and uh, Sasha also gave a glimpse at the E. Rosita, but um, uh, of course, E. Rosita is one of the X-ray telescopes on SRG, which was launched last uh, two years ago. Um, and you can see this is the larger uh, structure there. Our, our Arctic Sea is shown in the bottom panel, bottom of this figure here. And we are we have basically seven independent telescopes. They are um, somewhat identical in terms of um, the structure, but then some of them have um, on-chip filter on them, two of them. So that's the only difference. And they basically look at the same patch of the sky simultaneously observe the same tile sky at the same time. Um, and we are the basically soft X-ray instrument on SRG. Our sensitivity is between 2.2 keV to 10 keV band. And um, of course, there is no need to say this, but our large grasp with Erosita and ability to scan tiles, in fact, makes us a perfect um, uh, all sky survey instrument. And uh, our PSF is very uh, stable uh, through the tiles about 30 arc second in the field of view. We have also improved spectral resolution over the Chandra and XMM Newton observations. Um, so that's great. You can see nice features in the spectra, but most importantly, our background is very low and stable. And that is, of course, that plays an important role when you uh, analyze the X-ray emission from faint sources like clusters of galaxies. And this plot shows you a comparison in red. We show you the um, Erosita background in different bands. And uh, in comparison, MOS is shown in green and uh, PN observations background are shown in blue. You can see not only that we don't see the peaks uh, due to solar flares, but overall the normalization is pretty low as well. Our large sensitivity in the soft band is optimized for detecting clusters. So our basically main science goal with Erosita is to do cluster cosmology by counting experiment. So if you look at our schedule, basically, uh, you know the launch date now. Um, after we reached L2, our current orbit, we have started our Cal PV observations. And that was basically the end of 2019. And I will talk about the results from that call PV observations mostly today, but I will show you also a glimpse of what is coming up for the ERAS-1 survey. And then in December 2019, we have started All Sky Survey and we have been performing uh, observations of the sky since then. And we just finished the third scan of the sky and um, um, ERAS-4 is ongoing at the moment. And by the way, the data from this call PV observations are public now. So you're very welcome to go to MPE Rosita's webpage and uh, go to science portal and play with the data by yourself. Within that call PV program, we have observed three clusters basically uh, with deep observations. The idea was basically to test our observation, test the e Rosita, um, and compare our observables from X-rays 
with the other X-ray telescopes like Chandra and XMM Newton. Um, and among these are about 3158 UGC cluster and 3266. In one of our PV uh, observations, we have serendipitously discovered this cluster and we used it as a calibration source. But upshot is basically E. Rosita agrees very well with XMM Newton and Chandra. We think that we understand our data and can analyze it well. Under the performance verification program, we have scanned two large regions. One of them is the spectacular system, about 3391 and 95 system. And uh, the other one is this mini survey we performed, EFETS. I'll mostly talk about EFETS. I cannot move on though without mentioning this beautiful result, which came out earlier in 2021, where we um, were looking basically deep in this uh, system about 339195 system. We have discovered this filament which connects this northern group to the southern group and about 3391 and 95, in fact, sits in between this uh, filament. And this is the longest filament discovered in emission. Um, it's, it, about, uh, it, it covers about 15 megaparsec region from north to south. So it looks very much like simulations. Now we started mapping large scale structure in the universe and that is really absolutely beautiful. But I need to say that this, it was discovered in um, surface brightness excess, not in the spectra. So let's talk about this survey, mini survey we performed because this survey is very important for uh, showing the capabilities of um, all sky survey to you. Um, and this basically we designed a survey to get a glimpse at the final Eurozita all sky survey that we will reach um, uh, at the end of the four year survey. So the depth is um, basically at the same depth with the final Eurozit All Sky Survey. It covers about 140 square degree in the equatorial region. And you can see the, the size um, compared to the moon's angular scale here in angular scales. And in fact, this is the largest contiguous survey ever performed with an X-ray telescope. Um, and the reason why we actually selected this region is that we covered this region with the deep optical surveys so we have um, HSC coverage from the almost 90% of the area and then decals. And then we have spectroscopic follow-up observations with gamma and SDSS. In this 140 square degree region alone, we have detected 27,910 X-ray sources. And wherever you look at an X-ray sky, you will notice that majority of the sources are AGNs and point uh, stars like point sources and 2% of them are clusters of galaxies. So they look like diffuse emission uh, here in this image. And then uh, once we detect these clusters in extent, right, we go look at the accompanying uh, optical data with HSC, and then we measure the photometric redshifts. And then we do go follow up with SDSS to measure the spectroscopic redshifts. So we found 542 clusters of galaxies in the extent selected sample. This corresponds to four clusters per square degree, which is basically right on target um, in terms of cluster counts at this depth. And if you want to look at the 3D view of these clusters in the EFITS field, that video basically shows it. Um, the nearby clusters are shown in blue purples, large ones, and the high redshift clusters are shown with red dots over here. So this basically figure shows you Erosita is very good at detecting nearby groups and clusters, but also very efficient in detecting high redshift clusters, which is, I think, remarkable. The other um, thing we have first discovered in this field is that we started seeing some connecting structures, connecting clusters of galaxies. So in this picture here, there are eight clusters of galaxies which seem to be linked to each other. Um, and these objects are in fact called superclusters. They're the last leg of uh, structure uh, formation of the universe. They're not formed yet. Um, they are in the process of collapsing in gears of time scales. They will form these very massive uh, clusters in the, in, the, in the universe. And we find 19 of them in this field. The first one was already published 
And then we have um, added 18 extra in our um, catalog paper. And these are the most massive ones basically in the field. This one consists of 10 clusters of galaxies. It's the absolutely the most massive one in the field. And uh, we actually detect pretty high redshift ones as well with e -Rosita. It just, again, highlights how e -Rosita is efficient in mapping the large scale structure. It will come up again, by the way. Um, let's go back to the clusters that we detected in the EFITS field. One of our observables, actually it is the main observable, is the luminosity. If you look at the luminosity as a function of redshift, these are uh, basically uh, are all the clusters, 542 of them shown in this plot. And if you just uh, plot the flux upper limit, a uh, flux limit of the EFIT survey, it's 1.5 times to 10, 10 to the minus 14 CGS. And you can see it's right on target. It's exactly the number we have given in our um, 2012 Marloni et al. science paper. And by looking at the number of clusters um, and their redshift distribution here, our median redshift is about 0.35 as expected, but we do go out to redshift of 1.3. So that's remarkable. Um, when you are dealing with surveys, especially X-ray surveys have really complicated selection functions. The way that we approach to this issue is that we basically uh, use the X-ray observ observations currently of the clusters of galaxies and other X-ray sources, as a matter of fact, and use the state-of-the-art numerical simulations for dark matter halos. We basically put them into the uh, machinery and mock the Erosita sky with the simulations. And then from these simulations, we build our selection function. And that selection function is shown in this figure here. You can see um, our detection probability as a function of luminosity and redshift in this figure. So our basically all our calculations are based on this selection function and this selection function is fully folded into our science analysis. So again, the, sign, uh, the um, selection function is in the background, overplotted are the luminosities and redshifts of the 542 clusters we detect once we have this uh, selection function, we can go ahead and calculate our completeness level and contamination level. In the full sample, of course, we have some contamination, about 20%. And this contamination basically driven by background fluctuations or um, several AGNs basically clustered together. And then we detect that at a, as a, an extended emission. Or sometimes there is a very bright cluster um, nearby, and we can detect we, our source detection algorithm splits into two. But we have a full understanding of what happens, and when that happens, so, uh, thanks to these simulations, so we take those into account carefully. And at this sample, <clears throat> we are complete at 40% level. And you can do some uh, cuts on the sample based on your science needs. So you can have a complete sample, and you can have a a pure sample, so we just provide in our catalog paper several options if you would like to actually uh, want more pure sample, uh, purer sample than um, the full sample. Um, though those are all available in our catalog paper. For some clusters, we also have temperature measurements. So of course, now in addition to ROSAT, we have full band coverage, so we can measure the temperature of uh, clusters now from the, the shape of the thermal bram stralum and about 20% of the clusters, we can measure the temperatures. And this is the LT relation at the physical radius that we measure of about 120 clusters. So one thing we've also looked at is the luminosity function with this sample. So the full sample results are shown here. And then we apply more strict cut to, to reduce the contamination and in fact, we find very consistent results with similar surveys like XXL. So that is always reassuring. And then we divided our sample into two to look at the evolution in the luminosity function. And uh, we find that basically we don't really observe any evolution, even if we just use the purest sample. And that is very much in line with what has been observed in the literature. One other thing we could do, uh, basically, that we looked at the morphological parameters of the detected clusters in a much purer sample. 
The idea is basically to classify clusters uh, as relaxed, round looking, boring clusters or disturbed mergers. The uh, reason why we want to do that, because we want to build scaling relations from our sample. And when you actually include mergers, disturbed clusters in the sample, they introduce extra scatter. And we do not want this extra scatter in our sample because we want to basically control our systematics in our final cosmology analysis. So we have developed a method now to take into account all morphological parameters that we could meaningfully measure from this sample and combine those to characterize these clusters as relaxed and disturbed. And these are basically the morphological parameters we looked at. And um, this, these are one of them, actually, the central density is shown in this uh, plot. You can see the central density is a function of luminosity and central density is a function of redshift. For the first time, we cover such a large luminosity and redshift range than what is available in the literature. So we can actually go and look at the evolution of the number density or other morphological parameters with luminosity and redshift at the same time. So in comparison, for example, there is one-to-one -one comparison that's Lovisari et al. 2017 in our morphology paper that is coming from Planck ESC survey. You can see that Planck, for example, could only cover very luminous clusters um, for a very limited redshift range, while we extend that sample now at much lower luminosities and much larger redshift range. So, um, and we do observe some significant evolution in both redshift and uh, luminosity range for these morphological parameters. After taking that evolution into account, we then look at the distribution from uh, passage from the, the disturbedness and the, 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 the relaxed state of these clusters. And some studies basically in the literature reported by modality, some didn't. And we don't really see any bimodal distribution in our sample. The, the, the distribution from the relaxed to unrelaxed states are pretty much uniform. That's very nice to see. In fact, we are uh, parsing also the passage stage of these clusters. As there are five minutes left. Thank you. And then, of course, one of the most important things is the weak lensing weak, uh, mass calibration we would like to perform with our observations. And this is the most important step to go to cosmology, because we need to know the masses of these systems and then build up the mass function. Now we have demonstrated this with HSC, and you can see the luminosity mass scaling relations for the EFET sample. And uh, in dashed line, it's shown in, uh, the dashed line shows the self-similar scaling relations. Um, and we see some departures, but not too significant. And as a matter of fact, Eurozita covers a very nice uh, mass range compared to other cosmological probes. So you can see from um, optical or SC-based surveys, we probe a very, very unique um, area in the mass scales here. Uh, one other thing that I am very excited about is to find these uh, clusters, which will basically test Lambda CDM cosmology model. So we are looking for very peculiar clusters, which are very massive for their redshift. So in fact, several of them has been found by SC surveys. Some of them are um, really famous. So you have heard of probably El Gordo Phoenix, and we do find these clusters in our all sky survey. So one of the things that we've looked at in EFETS, if we see these kind of clusters, but EFETS is a very well studied survey. Although we have discovered about 200 new clusters, we did not discover such a poster child in this field, but I will talk about our strategy, how we have performed this. And this basically this strategy is very powerful uh, for ERAS-1 survey, we will discover several of these poster children in the Old Sky survey. So if you look at, for example, these clusters, um, I need to basically explain this to you. These clusters generally, because they are dominated by very bright BCG and AGN in their center, they basically are characterized as point sources 
um, in our source by our source detection algorithm. So they basically they get misclassified. But then we catch them by running our optical identification code on the point source select so like, uh, point source catalog. And we just look for the red sequence around the point sources. And we have actually identified extra 350 clusters of galaxies in the EFEX field. We find these clusters. Um, and um, if you look at the redshift distribution of these clusters, it's very much like extent selected sample, but we were able to find a few massive high redshift uh, clusters this way. If you look at total number of clusters actually in the EFETS field, that ranges up to 900 or so um, in this very small region, right? And then we looked at luminosity, uh, redshift distribution of these clusters to maybe understand why actually they went into the point, point source catalog. They look very much like point sources. They are very much dominated by the point source in their center and their luminosity in general are lower than our extent selected sample flux limit. So we would have never discovered these clusters because they lie below our flux limit, but we find them because the emission is basically boosted by the AGN in their sample. Sometimes even we even uh, detect radio, of, uh, radio emission from the central AGN. So that's very nice to see. And in general, they are much mass, less massive than extent selected sample, which is shown in gray here. And the point, the, the clusters in the point source catalog are shown in the blue data points here. So this is a strategy we will also follow to find these Phoenix and Algorda like clusters in all, all sky survey. I will spend a few minutes um, to give you a glimpse in what is coming up in the all sky survey, because the data, as you have seen before, looks beautiful. And in this map also, majority of the sources are point-like sources. But we do detect clusters of galaxies like Virgo cluster, for example, here. In this, in this whole picture, there's 20,000 clusters of galaxies ranging up to 1.5, a redshift of 1.5. Of course, in the German side, we only have the data rights of the southern half of the sky. So I'll show you the results from uh, initial results from that catalog. And in fact, in our part of the sky, we have detected 12,000 cluster candidates. And about 1,500 of these clusters are already known by the other X ray and SC surveys, but we found 10,000 um, unique clusters in the sample. And this video basically shows you a uh, distribution of clusters of galaxies, which is centered in an uh, average array and deck in Cartesian coordinates, but it highlights how many low mass clusters, nearby clusters that we detect, but we also detect large number of high redshift clusters in the extent selected sample only. And we have a very rigorous follow-up program. We have a code basically ingests several um, uh, high quality optical survey surveys, which we have now fully ingested legacy DR9. We also use DESI and OIR and PANSTAR surveys for our redshift identification. We can also identify high redshift clusters thanks to the, the wise maps provided by these surveys. And these are the individual basically clusters that we have identified in our um, hemisphere so far. Um, one last highlight is that basically, if you look at the EFETs, right, and look at these wedge maps, distribution of these clusters in these very famous web, map, web uh, wedge maps that you used to see from galaxy surveys, right, um, they are shown in red circles, basically. And in gray, you can see the galaxy distribution. So this really covers a very small region of the sky, about 140 square degree, right? You can't really see much in this plot. But what is coming is absolutely stunning. If you look at the detection of the very nearby clusters in the universe in the same type of wedge plot, you get this picture. So. You can look at this, the galaxy distributions from the optical surveys with the spectroscopic redshifts are shown in gray again, 
and the clusters of galaxies detected by Eurozita are shown in red. And Eurozita can detect large scale structure, which is stunning in my opinion. And this is coming up uh, very soon. The left hand side is already public for you to play. So this was basically how I want to end my presentation with this very exciting note. Um, and just want to summarize that basically EFETS already demonstrated that we, we will reach the numbers that we have predicted um, and projected in the beginning uh, with a four cluster per square degree um, uh, source density. And we detect low redshift, low mass clusters, low luminosity clusters, and very high mass clusters at high redshifts. Um, right, and then this CalPV data is basically public since Tuesday for you to be able to play. And we are all looking forward to ERAS1 results. Thank you very much. And I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Ezra. Indeed, we have a couple of minutes, maybe a little bit more to, for questions. So please go ahead, uh, Piero. Yes. Hi, Ezra. Beautiful results. Um, one, one curiosity and one quick question. The curiosity is what's the fraction of clusters for which you can get the ratio from the iron line? And, uh, so far, and, and and then the other thing is you look, you you show this uh, sort of point like clusters, which uh, if I understood correctly, were sort of possibly missed in previous surveys because you know they were not extended. However, uh, you also said that the number counts seem to be perfectly online with the previous surveys, which are ROSA based. So I don't, I do you, how do you reconcile these two things? Yes, okay, so let me just start with the first uh, question, and that was... Uh, the, the, iron, the, the iron line redshift. Ah, the iron line, iron line, yes. So um, you probably have seen the, the effective area curve from um, uh, Sasha's previous talk. We don't have much sensitivity in the iron K band, so we really detect iron K line in very bright nearby clusters, and there are not very many um, detections out there. But we detect iron L line. So it is possible for the nearby bright clusters that we have enough counts, right, to detect the redshift from the iron L shaft. Um, and this being said, I mean, of course, we are relying on the underlying atomic codes being uh, complete, um, but it is possible. So the second question, what my um, comment was that we are online with our own predictions. Um, so for the extent selected sample and the flux limit we have given in terms of cluster numbers and the flux limit is what has been predicted in our earlier science papers. For example, wow. Manoni et al. 2012. I wasn't really comparing with the other surveys. Okay, no, it would be interesting to look at the old Rosa counts and whether right. there is really and a missing just, fraction. Okay. Right, right, exactly. So, for example, for the Rosat, right, Phoenix was discovered like that. Rosat identified Phoenix, which is a very high redshift massive cluster, as a point source. And then a C survey comes along, and of course, they detected the cluster from the SC decrement. And um, so these kind of things will happen with E. Rosita, right? Um, and even beyond the Rosat limit, because Rosat could see very nearby clusters and very bright clusters. And we just push that luminosity uh, limit way below that Rosat's flux limit. So we have time for one last question, Nabila. Uh, hello, so thank you very much for uh, this talk and the fantastic results. So thanks a lot to all the team. So it was just a comment on what you were mentioning about these clusters that you're, you're, that are below, in fact, the flux image. I think it's very much uh, similar to what we were finding with Planck uh, when we compared with the X-ray. That is, uh, the um, 
let's say the SZ selection is really targeted toward the pressure and usually the surface brightness are, are, are flatter or shallower, which makes the objects uh, a, bit, a bit lower from the, from the flux limit, I mean pure flux limit, which is X-rays. So I think it, it goes very much in, in line and, and it's really fantastic because it will, I think it will open up a lot of uh, prospects for interacting clusters, high pressure clusters, and the combination with SZ will be great for this, uh, for this purposes. So it was just a comment. Thanks again for the talk. Bye-bye. Yes. Thank you very much. It's absolutely true. We are very much looking forward to cross match with the SC catalog, uh, catalogs from Planck or ACT or his PT. Okay, thank you very much, Ezra. Thank you all for the questions. I, I think we need to move on. Um, so the next speaker is Dr. Tanimura from the Institut d'Astrophysique Spatiale de Orsay in Paris. And he will actually uh, give us some perspective of yeah. Uh, detecting the warm hot intergalactic medium in the cosmic web with the Rosita. Please. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. We can see your slides okay. Okay, so it's fine. Okay. Uh, thank you for giving me an uh, opportunity to talk about my work. Uh, I will talk about the prospect for WIM detection uh, in the cosmic web by Rosita. So my name is Hideki. Uh, I'm a postdoc working with Nabira. Also, uh, this work has been done also with Marion Dusty and the Alexander Prozi and the Nicola Marabasi. Uh, yeah. Uh, motivation of this uh, work is called missing barium. And we know now uh, barium density is roughly 5% of the energy density of the universe. And this value is well constrained by CMB observation. But still, uh, rate time observation do not find all of the barium for decades, or in, in someone say uh, there are still uh, some uncertainties because there are some overlaps. And uh, if you look at the recent uh, uh, pie chart of detected barium uh, 10 years ago, there's a galaxy and CGM ICM. And this pie chart is not uh, changed so much in the recent paper also. And okay, so question is where is the missing barium? Now we have a large high, uh, hydrodynamical simulation. And this predicts that the uh, missing barium is located in the cosmic web and with the density of 10 to 100 times the average cosmic density, which is very low. And the temperature is roughly 10 to the five to 10 to the seven Kelvin, uh, which is called warm, hot intergalactic galactic media uh, in WIM. Uh, Left-hand side, I show uh, evolution baryons. Uh, this is a mass fraction uh, of baryons along the time. Uh, galaxy and ICM uh, gas in galaxy clusters are very minor component uh, at, and at redshift uh, three, uh, very high redshift. Most of the baryons are warm gas uh, temperature less than uh, 10 to the five. Uh, but this, is, uh, this gas is accelerated by uh, cosmic structure evolution and heated, this uh, phase is turned to wind. Uh, so this purple line basically heated up and changed to wind. This black line basically uh, results almost uh, uh, no uh, heating from baryonic effect, but if you add uh, uh, additional heating from baryonic effect, such as star formation and supernova AGN, the uh, portion of gas increased because of the heating by uh, baryonic effect. And now it's reached to 50%. Uh, in this presentation, we report we detected this wind gas in the cosmic web filament uh, using ROSAT X ray and the Planck SC maps for the first time, but with uh, marginal uh, significance, which is roughly four sigma. So we also uh, predicted how uh, Irozita can improve this detection for the wind. And this is the data set we use for the detection of the WIM. Uh, one is filament catalog identified with SDSS galaxy. We use the uh, disperse method. This is a filament finder algorithm. 
And this is the length of filament and the redshift of the filament we detect. And basically, we used uh, 15,000 filament uh, lending, lending, sorry, lending from uh, 30 to 100 megaparsec and redshift of 0.2 to 0.6. And uh, here I want to emphasize uh, there are many studies about short filament, less than 50 megaparsec. There are detection using weak lensing and SC, but it's still challenging uh, if you go beyond uh, 50 megaparsec, because most of the filament, long filament, are morphologically uh, complicated. These are mostly carved. And another data set we use is uh, Rosat X ray maps and the Planck SC maps. Uh, but uh, the signal from WIM is very weak, so we use stacking method. Uh, we stack filament with Rosat maps. Uh, but before uh, stacking filament, we mask all the galaxy clusters uh, detected in optical and X-ray SC uh, down to uh, three times 10 to the 13 solar mass. And this is a list of uh, clusters uh, we mask. We mask Planck SC clusters, Rosat X-ray clusters, and also SCSS, Red Mapper, and the WHL AMF clusters. We mask all of them. Uh, with three times R500, but still uh, it's not complete. So we also add the mask of critical point uh, identified in the dispersed method. This is basically over dense region of galaxies. So in this mask, basically we mask all the end point of filaments. And we also mask X-ray point sources from uh, Rosa Chandra x ray in Newton. This is a list of uh, uh, point source catalog from Rosa uh, Chandra and the XMM. We, they are all masked. Then uh, we compute radial profile of filament. Uh, and this is an illustration how we com compute. Uh, this first uh, identify the position, central position, spine of filament. And we basically compute the radial profile from the center. Um, but uh, clusters uh, sometimes are in foreground background, they are masked. In these regions are not used. And just blue point illustrate how a uh, uh, pixel on Rosat map is assigned to a uh, uh, pyramid center to calculate the distance. And we, I also define the background region. Uh, we subtract the background and we define the background region for each pyramid, uh, which is distance uh, from the center uh, 10 to 20 megaparsecs. So basically, uh, we have one radial profile for one uh, each filament. And finally, uh, but fi finally, sometimes there is a very large uh, mask. Uh, for example, there, there is a huge, massive galaxy cluster in front, and then there are galactic, galactic mask uh, cover almost all the filament region we remove these uh, filaments from the catalog. And finally, we get 15,000 filaments. And this is the result. Uh, we stacked 15,000 filaments uh, with uh, low set count rate maps uh, at six energy band uh, differently. And this is our detection of the signal. Uh, to check uh, this is a real excess or not, we do random tests. Uh, so we basically relocate uh, uh, 15,000 filament at random position and the stack. And uh, we repeat many times and we find these are consistent with zero. And so we, uh, with this uh, random test, null test, uh, we compute our significance of the signal and we find uh, four sigma uh, at this energy range 0.6 and uh, 1.2 keb uh, but we didn't find uh, any detection in uh, other bands lower band uh, lower energy band high energy band 
uh, lower energy band is dominated by uh, galactic emission, so signal to noise is low, so we didn't detect it. And the high energy band, uh, we didn't detect uh, any signal. Uh, it's a good sign for us because the, this is a rain, uh, region, energy region of ICM. So this is the uh, good sign uh, of we mask uh, galaxy clusters uh, well. Uh, and in this detection, we insist this is the first detection of X-ray emission from the WIM in the cosmic wave filament. Uh, just to remind, there are some detection uh, using uh, absorption, uh, but here we really detect the X-ray emission uh, from the WIM. Okay, uh, I, in this slide, uh, we check the contamination from X-ray point sources. Uh, we check this uh, by just uh, uh, stacking uh, with a point source mask, X-ray point source mask, and without this mask. And this is the difference, and we didn't find a significant difference. Okay, uh, so now we go to spectral analysis to get some physical parameter of the gas in filament. But uh, before, uh, we additionally masked uh, overlap region of different filament at different, red uh, different redshift because on the 2D map, uh, filament are overlap uh, on the sky. We mask uh, the cross point of uh, different pyramid at different redshift because it may bias our analysis. And we perform spectral analysis uh, of the X ray emission. Uh, we focus on filament core uh, due to the signal to noise. Uh, we focus on two megaparsec uh, from the center of the filament. And this is uh, energy spectra, blue, uh, sorry, uh, black lines. Uh, uh, our data at different energy band. And the cyan is from the random test, null test, which is consistent with zero. And the red uh, color is the fitting result. Uh, for the fitting, we use this model, APEX model for the gas, and then we uh, redshift is 0.44. It's a median redshift of filament. And we use metallicity of 0.2 of solar value. And uh, uh, H1 gram density is uh, from uh, the measurement of H1 4 pi maps. And finally, you obtain the surface brightness of 0.06 times 10 to the 12 in this unit at this energy range. And we, we compute uh, the over density of the gas at the core of the filament. Uh, assuming uh, beta model, and we get over density is roughly 30 at the center of filament. And we also uh, get uh, gas temperature, which is roughly 0.9 keV. And we will check uh, these values uh, also uh, using uh, SC measurement, our SC measurement. Just uh, you, if you are not familiar with SC effect, is SC effect is the distortion of the CMB spectra uh, caused by high energy electron in galaxy clusters. So essentially, in X-ray and SC, we can probe the same gas uh, and electron. Uh, so it's a good uh, probe to check each other. So we. Uh, jump onto the result with SC map. Uh, here we stacked uh, 24,000 filament. Uh, now we use Frank SC map, not uh, Losat maps. Uh, just note uh, there's a difference in the number of filament. This is just because uh, we uh, use a different mask. Uh, like in SC, uh, main point source contribution from radio source and infrared source. And X-ray is coming from X-ray point sources. That's the difference. But there are many overlaps. And we finally uh, detect the signal from filament uh, with SC. Uh, again, uh, we uh, check uh, this is true or not using this random test, neural test, in the same way as data, we relocate uh, filament on 
uh, on the sky randomly. And we find the excess uh, using this random test and compute the significance of 4.4 uh, sigma. And using this detection, we estimate gas density and temperature in filament. Uh, we fit the average SC profile, uh, assuming isothermal filament, uh, which is constant temperature with uh, a beta model, which is a basically the same model we use for ROSAT data. And just ignore constant density here. And the red line is the result of the fitting. Fitting is very well, and we obtain uh, the over density of uh, 90 and the temperature of uh, 1.4 times 10 to 6 Kelvin, uh, which is uh, corresponds to 0.1 uh, keV. We compare this value with uh, X-ray measurement with ROSAT and X-ray uh, over density, we get roughly 30, uh, 30. And SC is 19 plus, these are basically consistent within uncertainty, really consistent. But if you look at X-ray temperature, which was, which was 0.9 kb, here is in SC, we get 0.1 kb. But statistically now, uh, because of the uh, larger uncertainty here in X-ray measurement, we get uh, 1.2 uh, sigma consistency. We take you five minutes left. Oh, okay, thank you. Yes, uh, but we, of course we consider why there is a difference like this. Uh, this is basically we consider X-ray temperature is estimated as the core uh, uh, two megaparsec uh, from the center, but SC temperature is average within uh, five megaparsec. And this implies the uh, temperature trend in the filament. So temperature is high in the center of filament, and, but it's uh, lower in outskirts. This is actually already seen in the, uh, in the hydro simulation, especially statistically, uh, especially uh, uh, Galera uh, Espinoza et al. Uh, she shows statistically temperature profile of filament. And she showed uh, temperature exponentially drop beyond two megaparsec. Maybe which this difference is what we are seeing now in the hydro simulation. And uh, now, uh, finally, we move to uh, prediction for erosita because uh, erosita has a higher sensitivity than dosat. And we assessed erogeta's detectability of X-ray emission from wind in filament. First, we estimate uh, the background uh, from erogeta science book. Uh, I use the page, oh, sorry. I use the same number written in the science book and we estimate the background. Uh, this includes galactic and the extra galactic and also instrument. And uh, we also simulate the signal from filament. Here we consider stacking of uh, 15,000 filament we used uh, for a ROSAT analysis. And we estimate X-ray spectrum of each filament at given gas density and temperature. Uh, to be more realistic, we also include uh, filament orientation on the sky, also effective area, because some filaments are really um, uh, masked. We cannot use all the sky. And we find uh, still one third of the STS region is available. And for the, uh, uh, this one is, uh, uh, we use a gas temperature of 0.9 kV and over the still 30 estimate with uh, ROSAT data. Uh, for the model, we use the same model used for uh, data analysis with ROSAT. ROSAT uh, with, we use APEC model, metallicity of 0.2, and this uh, uh, H1 gram density, but we also include a, a redshift of each filament and orientation, also effective area. And we stack the filament. This, uh, this is a background and blue line is a background. We stack the filament uh, 10 and 100 and 1,000 and 10,000. 
um, if you stack uh, all the filament, filament 15,000, you expect uh, a large signal to noise. Uh, but just to remind, this is the uh, center of the filament. So we also consider lower density and temperature from our SC measurement. And this uh, left to high left hand side, this is a case of temperature of 0.3 KB and over density of 90. Uh, the blue line uh, background and uh, red line is stacking of filament. And here we also optimize the energy range uh, uh, for this uh, physical parameters and uh, we find uh, 0.3 and 0.8 kb is optimal to probe uh, the, the gas in this temperature and density. We also go a lower temperature. Uh, this case is 0.1 kb and over density will be 20. And this is the optimal energy range for this detection, uh, which is 0.3 and 2.5 kb. And finally, we get this picture. Uh, this is the signal to noise as a function of stacked filament uh, with different physical quantities. <clears throat> and if uh, the temp gas temperature is 0.9 kb and over density 30, uh, there is a many hopes for the detection of gas over five sigma. Um, but if you go lower temperature, uh, it's a uh, signal to, to noise goes down. Uh, for example, point, point 0.3 kb and the over density of 90, uh, we lose a signal to noise uh, because uh, noise is more dominant. But still, uh, 22,000 filaments uh, lead to five sigma detection, even if temperature is low as uh, 0.3 kb uh, here. But if you go lower temperature, 0.1 kb, uh, there's almost no hope for detection. But this is kind of showing uh, maybe we, are, we have a good hope for detecting uh, at the center of pyramid. We still have some uh, probes for outskirts. But if you go really further from the center of pyramid, we lose uh, sensitivity. Yeah, I finish here and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank thank you. You. So we have time for questions. Please um, raise your hand in the reactions box. Ezra. Hi, Hideki, very quick question. And a very nice results, it's very exciting. Um, did you assume ERAS 8 depth here, the final depth, or um, how did, what did you assume, assume for the depth of the survey? Uh, uh, okay, so it, in this case, very, uh, I take the simple case. So we assume uh, flat observation of 2K, uh, how to say, 2K, 2K observation. So it's, I assume, flat. So kind of a bit. Uh, not realistic, yeah, but we okay. flat, uh, assume flat observation here. Yeah. Two kilosecond, you mean? Uh, so, sorry? You mean two kilosecond exposure? Yeah, two, ki ah, sorry, two kilosecond. Every, everywhere yes. the same. Okay. Yes, cool. yeah, average, yeah. Yeah. Okay, nice, thank you. Other questions? One quick comment I would make is that, um, Compared to the, I don't think this really makes much of a difference for you for your estimation. But compared with the background model of the science book from 2012, we now have real background measurements. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they are both reported in Predel et al. 2021 and in the IFETS papers. And in fact, we are actually releasing also our you know particle background observation with the filter we close. The main point is that yeah, yeah. above 2 kV we are measuring a higher background that was predicted back then in 2012 for a, for a combination of reasons, bad modeling of the instrument or, and, and you know, higher uh, flux from, of cosmic rays. 
of course above 2 kV this does not really change I think mm -hmm. the, the the perspective for detection in the software mm -hmm. because the actually the soft background mm -hmm. is very much consistent with the model mm -hmm. quite accurately in fact yeah 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 uh, uh, I also yeah I also heard about this and uh, but still it's a uh, very hope uh, for the center of filaments we lose the sensitivity uh, yeah, we use the signal to noise if background is higher, if temperature is low. So maybe uh, uh, it's difficult to detect outskirts gas in filament, but still if you know the position of center of filament, I think there's still a, a, yeah. a lot of hopes. Yeah, that's but the I background. Uh, what I'm saying is that the background between 0.3 and 1.5 is exactly yeah. as predicted. So ah, the, yeah, okay. the higher background is only above 2 kV. Okay. Okay. I see. Or, or around that. I mean, that, there there is some discrepancy, but at the energies that are more relevant for this detection, in fact, there there, there is no significant difference. Yeah. 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 And also, we can optim optimize the energy range for signal to noise yeah right yeah okay uh any last question for you becky no that's not the case so we are only five minutes late which is great i would propose now we have a short break in the interest of time also because our the time for our session is really uh, fixed we we only break for 15 minutes now we reconvene at 11.15. We have three more very interesting talks about early Rosita results, very exciting. So uh, I will just keep the Zoom open, mute uh, my microphone and uh, restart the session in 15 minutes at 11.15. See you later. Okay. 11.15, welcome back. I remind you all this meeting has been recorded. I was just counting, there are 22 parallel sessions in this meeting. So um, I'm sure there will be lots of people that will catch up with our talks later on. Um, and maybe someone will connect back, but we should start our program so that we can make sure we finish on time. So the next speaker of this session is Ricardo Arcodia from MPE, uh, who will present some very exciting new discoveries in the field of variable active galactic nuclei with the Rosita. Ricardo. Yes, thanks a lot. So I will start sharing my screen. And okay, you should be able to yep. see the slides. So thanks a lot, uh, I'm Ricardo Arcodia and I'm finishing my PhD at MP in Munich. I will present today some exciting Eurozita results, and, but this was actually a collaboration effort uh, involving many, many people which are listed here. And I'll, I want to first to go through an introduction for the possible people in the audience who are not familiar with observational astrophysics in X-rays or the nuclei of galaxies. So basically, um, supermassive black holes, which are creating, uh, are called active usually, and they emit X-rays, but these ones are not really the majority. Um, most of the supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies, which is typical for galaxies like ours or, or larger galaxies, are not uh, necessarily active. Therefore, if we pointed at them at an X-ray telescope, it would rather they would be undetected or perhaps just too faint to be detected or, or uh, they are completely inactive in X-rays, um, but some of them are active, and which means that the, the, the emission from, from, from the immediate vicinity of the supermassive black holes is actually outshining the whole galaxy, and then we would uh, see them in an X-ray image. Now, um, what, what's the typical X-ray emission from an accreting supermassive black hole? Actually, uh, X-ray variability uh, occurring on, uh, on hours on the time scales of hours, it was one of the first pieces of evidence of, of the existence of, of black holes at the center of galaxies. So therefore we are used to seeing uh, high amplitude variability uh, from, from the nuclei of galaxies. 
But even in the most extreme case, what we see is perhaps a factor of 10 or 100 of uh, variability in x-rays occurring over a few hours uh, or a few years, but in a, in a, in a, in a continuous way. Uh, what we are definitely not used to seeing in, in x-rays is um, something like the so-called quasi-periodic eruptions, which, which show themselves as very high amplitude and quasi-periodic soft x-ray bursts. Uh, coming from uh, galactic nuclei. Now, you can see here a couple of examples of the only two sources like this that were known before Rosita, one on the left and one on the right. And you can see uh, that their main characteristics is to having these this quasi-periodic flares in X-rays, which are quite narrow with respect to the um, separation between them. Now, based on these, on these first uh, couple of sources, what we were thinking about was that these sources were actually some weird active galactic nuclei. So um, why weird? Because typically uh, normal active galactic nuclei show broad lines in the optical and uh, infrared photometry, which suggests the presence of uh, additional obscuring material, which we usually call the infrared torus. But in this case, there was no such infrared excess and the optical spectra were showing only narrow lines. Now, why then do we call them still AGN? at least these first two sources, uh, well, because the, the, the narrow lines were indicating a clear, uh, clearly that these nuclei were ionized, uh, th th these uh, lines were ionized by, the, by an active nucleus. Another characteristic, which is interesting for people that study the coevolution of black holes and the surrounding galaxies, is that these two sources were, the estimate of their black hole mass was about between 10 to the five and 10 to the seven solar masses, which is typically the, the mass that you, which you have when you find black holes at the center of low mass galaxies. Now you see a plot here of black hole mass versus stellar mass of the host galaxy. And here the green circle is broadly where we think these QPEs are sitting. And as you can see, there are not many points just because there are not many sources observed in this regime. Therefore, uh, they could provide to us an interesting uh, mechanism through which the nuclei of low mass galaxies are active. Another uh, characteristic is that there are that, that there doesn't seem to be there there don't seem to be uh, other obvious peculiarities at other wavelengths. At least it's what we know so far. So the only way to spot them is via soft X-rays, and therefore we thought about using a Rosita after we we saw the first two publications. Which this is a very recent science case. It was basically born in 2019. Therefore we we thought about using a Rosita to find new candidates. Now we we saw a few nice presentations about a Rosita before. And I want to remind you that during the old sky survey, what happens is that uh, the Eurosita telescope finds, takes a, a short 40 second snapshots every four hours. Therefore, imagine there is a source that has QPEs ongoing. Eurosita might find uh, this source in a bright phase, then four hours later in a faint phase. So we don't detect it. Then again, faint perhaps, then bright again four hours later, then faint again. Therefore, you can see already that Eurozita can provide QPE candidates, but not already a confirmation. So we need to follow up with other telescopes. But this is basically, we set up uh, a machinery to search uh, specifically for QPE. So we, we actually set up this discovery machine on purpose, trying to find candidates like this. And in fact, uh, it was very successful because after the first year of Eurozita operations, we found two candidates which were confirmed, so two new QPEs, doubling the sample from two to four, which is already a great result. And these, these discoveries were published a couple of months ago in, in Nature. Now you can see on the left and right, the, the two QPEs found by Eurozita, and on the top you see the X-ray light curve where you can see that we have one point every four hours, basically. And uh, on the bottom panels, you see the X-ray spectra extracted for the bright uh, observation and the faint observation color coded in the same way. And you can see that the bright phase is very soft. There is no hard component. Most of the counts are below 1.5 kV or 2 kV. And this is typical for, for QPs. They are very soft uh, events in X-rays. Now, um, this is the optical image of the of the two galaxies with, with which we have, we associated the QPEs, and you can see in red the original Eurozita 
positional uncertainty. So we immediately associated these two objects with two galaxies, which is crucial to, to consider them as QPE candidates. Then you can see in green the, the, the improved positional uh, accuracy obtained with XMM. So we, we think these events are consistent with being nuclear, so coming from the nucleus of, of these galaxies. And then we perform X-ray follow-up. Now I'm showing the, the follow-up taken on the first, whoops, on the first um, QP found by Yosit. And you can see on the top, the two XMM Newton snapshots of about a day. And um, on the top panel of this uh, top uh, plot, there is the X-ray light curve. And you can see how we found that this source was somehow bursting but we couldn't really see or find uh, with, with XMM only if this was actually a periodic source at all or a quasi-periodic uh, eruption source. So we triggered an intense monitoring with NICER, you can see it on the bottom, which lasted 11 days, so an order of magnitude more than this data here on the top. And you can see nicely how this is actually uh, exactly what we were looking for. So sources is emitting that it's making X-ray flares every every few hours, and in this particular case, the time scale is very long, about eighteen or nineteen hours, and uh, the peak of these bursts is about is above ten to the thirty three, ten to the forty three ergs per second. So these are very very bright uh, in X-rays. And um, now I'm showing what is the X-ray spectrum of of uh, taken as taken by XMM Newton with red. I show the cumulative emission from the quiescence, so where the source, when the source is faint, you can see it's basically consistent with background in this case. But then in yellow and green, you see uh, the spectrum coming from two peaks, and you can see nicely how there is no hard photons above a couple of KVs. And uh, in fact, this is in line with what we found for the first two published QPs. Now, this is the follow-up taken on the second uh, QP, which we call Euro QP two. And you, you can see here uh, X-rays plus UV coming from XMM Newton, and one day of data was basically enough to to find uh, to confirm this as a QP source. And in fact, the periodicity here it's two hours and a half. Uh, the average period is two hours and a half with respect to the 19 hours that we saw before. And the this, this source is also an order of magnitude fainter in the peak, in the X-ray peaks. And you can see here the UV light curve how it's basically flat simultaneously to the X-ray flaring. And these uh, UV and optical points are, are most likely dominated by the galaxy. So um, the X-rays are for sure coming from the nucleus. The, the optical and UV data are probably dominated by the mission of the galaxy. Uh, at the same time, I'm showing here the, the, the spectrum for the quiescence phase in red and in green of one peak. Now, what you see here is that the X-rays uh, in this case are a bit absorbed. So the data points bend a little towards low energies, but in, with the continuous line in red and green, I'm showing what is the model spectrum once absorption is, is corrected. And you can see that the spectrum in questions is still very soft and consistent with the thermal spectrum. And in the bright phase, it gets a little bit harder, but still very little counts uh, are predicted above a couple of KVs. And Perhaps the most interesting part of this discovery was that when we first took the optical spectra of these two galaxies, which were unknown spectroscopically before, we were surprised to see that both of them are inactive in the sense that one, you can see it on the left, is a, just a spectrum of a passive galaxy. So there's no indication that there was previous AGN activity at all in this galaxy. And on the second one, it's the same, but you just see some narrow lines which are, which are due to star formation. So Despite seeing some narrow lines, this nucleus was also inactive. So there was there is no evidence of, of um, AGN activity, at least not popping up above the emission of the galaxy. And this is very important because since Rosita is, is an X-ray survey, we weren't really, uh, we didn't have any bias in terms of us galaxies. We just found two X-ray sources and they happen to be in inactive nuclei. Therefore, we can think of these two um, to, to be the, 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 the most typical if we can say this already with four sources, uh, QPEs. This might indicate, in fact, very interestingly, that QPEs might not need a pre-existing AGN accretion flow as we know it, as is typical for, for AGN, but perhaps it's just enough to have um, a low mass, supermassive black hole with some perturbation and perhaps 
still some some very inefficient where by inefficient i mean it is not really bright in any wavelengths above the galaxy uh, accretion flow now another interesting thing is is to find that uh, indeed these two when we when you take the when you model the stellar mass from the optical spectra you can see it on the x-axis now the red and blue points are our qpes and you see they are uh, about 10 to the 9 and a few 10 to the 9 uh, solar masses in, in stellar mass, which is uh, very, very, very low. These are very low mass galaxies. You can see as comparison, the black points, which come from a collection of STSS galaxies, how they are basically uh, almost all more, more massive than this. And you can see about uh, what, what I was saying before, that this is not a very studied uh, mass, uh, a well-studied mass regime in terms of of Os galaxy stellar mass because there are not many points <laughs> coming from all the collection of hundreds of thousand galaxies that we that we know. Therefore, this basically means that the, if these galaxies weren't doing crazy flares in X-rays, we wouldn't really study them or detect them at all, which uh, provides us an, an interesting way to, to study exactly what happens when the nuclei of these low mass galaxies are activated. And we can use QPs for these in the future. Now, um, let me discuss now a few insights that we, we, we provided with our new data and with our paper. Uh, first, we, find, we, we found that the, the, the extra properties of our or the QPs are inconsistent with the models that, that study the radiation pressure disk instability in the accretion flow. Now, very briefly, what the theory predicts is shown here, which is, to be fair, quite similar to what I showed you with the data, but uh, the devil is in the detail. For example, in this case, the model predicts that there is a slow rise in luminosity, which is uh, provided by, um, basically in the disk, there is a slow increase of matter and temperature in the, in the accretion flow. Then a specific condition uh, is triggered such that there is a very sharp burst in, in, in extra luminosity due to a runaway temperature incre increase in the flow which is however, however consistent with also a runaway decrease in, in density. So there is, after this runaway increase, there is not much uh, uh, matter to accrete anymore and the, and the luminosity goes down very sharply. And this model predicts as low rise and fast decay. But you, you can see here on the, on the bottom right that actually the profile of at least one of our QPs and one in the literature, so two out of four, is as asymmetric, but in the opposite way. So this wouldn't really be consistent with the prediction. But also what we did was to put in a plot here with the theory, uh, what this theory predicts about um, the black hole mass and the um, viscosity parameter, which is uh, for the ones that are not fami familiar, is just what, what relates the, the stress between the annually of the accretion flow to the, um, to the pressure in the disk. And in the model, it's, it, it, it makes sense when it is um, below one. Therefore, you can see here that the lines are what the model allows. And either we have a black hole mass, which is which makes sense for a low mass supermassive black hole, but on physically high viscosity parameter, or uh, vice versa, a physically meaningful viscosity parameter, but for masses that are way too low to explain the extra luminosity and basically most of the properties we see. And this is this was a this was uh, good to be put forward because this model of this these instabilities were actually one of the first things that were suggested to explain these QPs, but now we are uh, disfavoring them. Then the next scenario you think about when you see some periodicity in in your observed signal is, is a binary. And in particular, we first tested the case of a binary of two black holes with with similar mass, so with mass ratio about one. But we find due to several arguments that it is unlikely. For example, such binaries would emit uh, sinusoidal or periodic variability in every wavelength, uh, including optical, infrared, and UV. But we can see here uh, an optical light curve in two bands. There is no such uh, variability, and the QP is started at least here, according to Irozita. And this is a time span of uh, two, three years. And you can see as well in the infrared, there's not really much modulation. And I showed you already the UV, which is constant uh, throughout. You have the four uh, minutes left. Four minutes, perfect, thanks. And another important thing is that these binaries wouldn't, wouldn't produce sharp bursts uh, unless uh, what, what's uh, called binary self-lensing happened. 
And this happens when there is um, one when there is a favorable orbital inclination and one black hole passes in front of the other, and the radiation from the accretion disk which is behind is lensed. And this is the prediction by the model. So in principle, there could be narrow bursts, but uh, for example, in this paper, they, they don't really get to model uh, all the observational properties in terms of amplitude and, and duration. So it's still TBD, but most importantly, perhaps a lens would be achromatic, but the QPs have a very strong energy dependence. So this probably rules out this scenario as well. Um, Another indication that this is not really a binary with mass ratio unity is comes from the fact that such binaries, if they evolve with a period of the order of hours, they would be now very close to merger. Therefore, there would be already a strong period decrease due to gravitational waves emission. That's what we try to plot in a very, very simplified way here. This is the, the, the P dot, the period decrease as a function of the mass of the primary and color coded the mass of the secondary. And just to show you in red, it's the area excluded by data. And what I mean by this is that if there was, this, this red line is basically telling you if there was a, a period decrease of one cycle over nine in this data, which we would have already seen, um, the, 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 the P dot would be this. Therefore, this excludes an area which contains all the binary who's with mass ratio unity of 10 to the five, six and seven uh, for each of the black holes. Therefore, for several arguments, we, 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 we exclude this uh, black hole binary of mass ratio unity. Now, um, then this might indicate that this binary, if, if, if it's there, uh, has to be uh, with a high mass ratio. And it, this was in fact suggested in the literature. And it was suggested that there, there might have been a low mass supermassive black hole and a stellar mass compact object or a bit more massive than, than this. And this would be pretty much consistent with, with the fact that we observed two QPs from uh, previously inactive galaxies because, for example, one, one scenario for which when, when a star gets too close to a supermassive black hole uh, causes the so-called tidal, tidal disruption events. And these, in fact, happen uh, mostly or they're easier to spot when the galaxy is previously inactive. So this would, this would uh, be an interesting scenario. And it is also consistent with the first published QPEs in, by Newton collaborators, so the, the very first QPE which showed for a decade uh, a decay in X-rays before showing QPs. So during the decay, there was no QPs detected, despite there were observation long enough to, observations long enough to detect them. And the QPs then appeared about in 2019 after the X-ray decay. And this would be qualitatively in line with the fact that there is a, perhaps a massive star which got stripped by, from the envelope and this created the X-ray TD behavior. And after that, the remnant white dwarf of, of this massive star is now interacting with the, with the accretion flow produced by the TDE and perhaps producing this QPE at every, at every nearest approach. Now, this is very interesting because it would make, it could make QPEs the electromagnetic counterpart of the so-called extreme mass ratio spirals, which are detectable by LISA. Therefore, if this is indeed the, what, what causes QPEs uh, there is the bright future ahead for, for Athena and, and, and Lisa as, a syner as synergies. And we have, so far it's qualitative suggestion, but we have for the next year, both NICER and Zwift X-ray data incoming, uh, through which we can test if there is at all any period, any evolution of the period indicating perhaps that this binary with the extreme mass ratio is evolving. And there is still, however, a lot to do because we still don't really know what is causing this burst? Despite we can we can attribute the periodicity to this high mass ratio binary, but we don't really know yet what causes this burst. And I really hope uh, um, that many papers will come out soon to tackle this issue. So I invite you to stay tuned, and I'll quickly go through my summary in my last few seconds. So QPs are a new type of X-ray phenomena, and they're very important because they might tell you how uh, they provide you a new channel through which low mass galaxies are activated. We found two with Erosita in one year, in the first year of operations. So we doubled the sample of non-QPs from two to four. And our two were found in inactive galaxies. Um, therefore, this might hint that you don't really need a previously active galaxy to do QPEs, but perhaps just a low mass massive black hole. And the scenario which is currently under investigation is the one with a high mass ratio binary of a low mass supermassive black hole and a stellar mass or a bit more massive compact object. And this is uh, the aim of our future work, and we will try to test it soon.
And with this, I thank you, and I'm happy to take questions if there if there are any. Thank you, Ricardo. Are there any questions? I, I have a quick one. Um, maybe not so quick in the answer. You you mentioned the uh, in the um, extreme ratio in spiral scenario. The, the you just mentioned the possibility of this uh, partial stripping of the material. Can you say something about the actual emission process in that case? I know. I mean, this is a quite active area of investigation, but um, I wonder whether you can say something about possible emission mechanisms. So uh, that's a good point. As I said, we don't really know what, what is causing this burst. So in the case of a, of a TD, you can have uh, when, when the matter is stripped by the star and you can have emission coming from, from, from several things, not necessarily from accretion, but this is if QPs are, are um, indeed uh, the interaction the comp uh, between a compact object and already present newly born accretion flow, then I don't really know if it's necessary to have a partial stripping of it can be a mechanical interaction of the compact object with with a with a, a, a compact accretion flow on the bigger black hole and so far i can't really tell uh, which is which i would say that in both cases um, these qps would not last more than a few cycles um, which is already a prediction for 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 this scenario whatever causes the bursts yeah, I'm aware it was a very, very incomplete answer. We don't, we don't really know what, what would cause the bursts, uh, whether a partial stripping or um, a physical interaction of the compact object with the flow, which then um, goes through some sort of instabilities due to the, the, the passage of a compact object to it. But we do have quite a number of observations or, you know, spectral information. I mean, information from the data that one could yeah, use. Yeah, we, we, we know um, is that both the quiescence phase and the bright phase are soft in X-rays and yeah. consistent with a the thermal spectrum. Uh, let me show it again. So um, the only problem is that this is not uh, from quiescence, perhaps this one, from quiescence to, to, to the bright phase this doesn't um, follow the, the classical black body going brighter uh, with, with the luminosity going as the temperature to the, to the power of uh, to the fourth power. So this is not just uh, an accretion flow, which is present in questions, which just goes brighter mm -hmm. uh, within the, with the same area. There has to be uh, either um, the area of the black body changes due to perhaps the passage of the compact object through it or uh, there is additional and periodical inflow of matter from a partial stripping at every process passage, which which changes the, the configuration. Yeah. Thank you. If there are no more questions, I think we can move to the next speaker, Dr. Chandrai Maitra from MPE. That will tell us about the Erosita view of the uh, Magellanic system and the X-ray observation of the supernova 1987A. Yeah, Chandra, you can see your slides. I think you're ready to go. I forgot to start my video. Okay. Thank you very much, Andrea, for organizing the session and for inviting me to talk on the Magellanic clouds today. So today I will uh, present some first results um, with respect to the Magellanic system. Um, as well as extra observations of supernova 1987A, uh, both from the Calvi Pal PV phase and the first results from the Erosita survey. So what we see in the background here is an optical radio image actually of the Magellanic system because no complete view uh, of the Magellanic system in X-rays was available until before Erosita in uh, sensitive uh, broad energy band. So we see here the LMC, the SMC and the bridge connecting the two and they cover a large angular extent in the sky of the order of hundreds of square degrees. So 
In my talk today, I will first talk about uh, what we see in X-rays and why it's important to observe the Magellanic Cloud in X-rays. And then I will show some extra observations of the Magellanic clouds uh, obtained during the uh, CalPV phase of Erosita. And then I will also touch on some early science highlights and upcoming results from the Erosita survey data, particularly the first OSCI survey data. And then I will touch upon the future prospects and the questions we aim to answer in the next few years. So to provide first uh, overview of what we're talking about here, the Magellanic system, as I said, comprises of the large, the small Magellanic cloud and the bridge, uh, mostly of gas, but also some stellar content, uh, which connects the two. So these are irregular gas rich dwarf galaxies in our local group. They are strongly interacting with one another as well as with uh, our own galaxy. They have active uh, star forming histories and have a low metallicid environment, very different from our own galaxy. Uh, an advantage is that they have well-known distances, uh, well-determined distances and are moderately close by, um, and as well as have low galactic foreground absorption. So this combination allows one to uh, do source population studies in X-rays uh, down to a luminosity of about 10 power 33 arc per second. So when we talk about source population studies, uh, in the Magellanic clouds, especially in X-rays, um, what we can see is both the stellar content and the hot and stellar medium. However, I'm gonna concentrate on the stellar content uh, today. And the stellar content, we mainly see uh, several stellar endpoints. Uh, the first most important, uh, I would say, are the, these high mass extra binary population because these are the most overabundant uh, population uh, in the SMC as well as the uh, LMC. So high mass extra binaries have compact objects, usually a neutron star could be in uh, a black hole or a white dwarf in rare cases, which accrete matter from an early type stars and they shine in X-rays. They are typically uh, a few million years old and uh, they emit hard X-rays. So in an X-ray image, we see them as a hard X-ray point source. Then we have uh, these class of heterogeneous objects called super soft X-ray sources. Uh, they have super soft X-ray emission, which emit uh, usually below 0.5 kV and have surface temperatures of 40 to 80 electron volts. And um, they are classically uh, known to be uh, close uh, binary systems, which are accreting at a, where the white dwarf is accreting at a high rate and uh, there is a thermonuclear explosion on the surface of the white dwarf. However, they could be also so cataclysmic variables, nova, et cetera. And uh, typically uh, on an extra image, as, as they are super soft, we, uh, in a false color image, we see them as these red sources. Then we have supernova remnants, uh, which are, could be formed by collapse of massive stars or thermonuclear explosion of carbon oxygen white dwarfs, which produces 1A type supernovae. And as the blast wave interacts uh, with the surrounding medium, uh, they heat it up and shine in X-rays. And they are visible in X-rays for typically a few 10,000 kilo years. And we see them in the false color extra image as typically diffuse and extended objects with varied morphologies. Of course, the hot, hot interstellar medium also gives us a lot of information on the winds from massive stars, the supernovae, etc. But as I said, I will concentrate on the stellar contact, the stellar endpoints found in the Magellanic clouds. Uh, an important thing to remember is that uh, it's uh, not possible to identify these different classes of objects using X-ray alone. We need multivalent data, especially, for example, optical and infrared uh, photometry and spectroscopic information to identify high mass extra binaries, the type of the companion star, the nature of the super soft X-ray sources, and also distinguish between supernova remnants. So Magellanic clouds were uh, was observed uh, from the very early years of extra astronomy with Einstein, Rosat, but of course all with limited sensitivity and a narrow energy range. Uh, the Exxon Newton uh, Very Large Program provided us the first view of uh, this popular high mass extra binary uh, uh, objects in the Magellanic clouds and the supernova remnants. However, uh, we were limited by this uh, small field of view of Exxon Newton. So here's a typical example 
example of the large Magellanic cloud, where only the central region could be covered uh, with XM emitter. So let's come to the results. Um, um, and uh, first, uh, let's see the science highlights uh, during the calibration and performance verification phase of Erosita, which were um, between mid-September and until mid-December before the first All Sky Survey started. So in fact, the first light observation of Erosita was on the Magellanic Cloud in the 30 Doradus region, uh, uh, centered on the supernova 1987A. So the 30 Doradus region is a very active uh, star forming region in our galactic neighborhood and we see several supernova remnant, wind blown out of massive stars. So it's a beautiful region to observe in X-rays uh, and study um, the, uh, the diffuse as well as the point source population. We see here is the power of the large field of view of Erosita. And especially when we compare this with XMM, we see uh, how big an advantage Erosita has uh, provided us in this regard. Uh, talking a little about uh, supernova 1987A, which was the pointing center. So this is a very famous object in extra astronomy uh, where the supernova exploded in 1987. And this is an ideal template to link supernova to the remnants because it provides us the opportunity to actually observe the different stages uh, as the blast wave uh, moved through the surrounding medium. And what makes it most interesting is the fact that this surrounding medium is really structured and complex. In particular, it has this equatorial uh, ring made of dense clumpy structures and a less dense interclump uh, gas. And uh, this is embedded in a lower density H2 region. So the X-rays that we see comes from this lower density um, X-ray region, which emits a hot gas, uh, so higher temperature uh, plasma components, as well as a lower temperature component, which is due to the interaction of the blast wave with these dense circumstellar structures. So we see here uh, the, the erosite observation of supernova 1987A in 2019 uh, during the first light observation, which was uh, quasi-simultaneous with an XMM observation uh, at a similar epoch. And we see clearly here uh, the much a better energy resolution of Erosita and lower redistribution at low energies, which really brings out its power. So um, going to uh, the work that we did in this regard. Uh, so in the left and right, we see uh, the spectrum of supernova 1987A. This is with a very recent monitoring observation with XMM Newton in 2020. Uh, and this is uh, with a joint fitting of the EPIC PN and Erosita in the same epoch. Uh, we need uh, multi-temperature plasma components, a, a cooler, a warm, and a hot component to describe the spectrum and interaction with the different circumstellar structures, which the blast wave is propagating through. An important thing to note is that at the recent epoch, we see this hot component marked in black has overtaken uh, or is becoming dominant over the cool component, which was not the case before. So uh, we studied uh, the joint fitting of the Erosita and the XMM Newton observations and combined with uh, the XMM Newton observations of the last 14 years, we could obtain a very good handle on the flux and the spectral evolution of this object for the last 14 years. So the takeaway point from this study was um, we could actually for the first time uh, untie the uh, chemical compositions of the different plasma components. And we discovered that the chemical composition of the cooler and the warmer emission components is very different from the hot plasma component. These are more consistent with the grading spectrum observations reported before. But in the hot plasma component, the abundance of uh, oxygen, neon, magnesium, for example, is much higher. And this is a strong evidence that we have the component of the reverse shock, which is moving and heat Eating the ejecta becoming dominant now, and this is expected to grow in the next years. So in the next plot, we see uh, the flux evolution uh, in X-rays of supernova 1987A from days since explosion. And in blue, we have the XMM Newton in the soft and in green in the hard band. This is the same plot in linear, uh, in logarithmic and linear scale. And in red here, we see the flux obtained by the spectral fitting of Erosita in the same epoch. Uh, well, uh, the first point is that the results of Erosita broadly agree with XMM Newton. Uh, uh, a few questions? Uh, a, few, uh, a few questions, yes, yes, uh, a little bit. 
Uh, and we see that the peak uh, at the last epoch, the peak flux has dropped uh, by 18% from what, what it was during about day 10,000 after the explosion. And uh, this trend that the soft X-ray band is now very clearly declining while the hard band continues to increase with a smaller rate is a confirmation that we have now passed or supernova 1987A has now passed over this dense circumstellar structure and is moving beyond in the lower density medium and uh, the reverse shot component is uh, moving in and will become dominant in the next years. So apart from this, uh, there were also some pointings on the supernova remnant 132D of the LMC in the Cal PV phase. And this is a mosaic of the LMC, which shows these green objects, which are good high mass X-ray binary candidates because uh, they have a hard X-ray source coincident with an early type stars. However, no pulsation is known. Uh, for this object, uh, Mark 2013, there was a tentative pulsation known at 2013 seconds. And this was a supergiant high mass X-ray binary in the Magellanic clouds. With Erosita, uh, we've discovered that uh, taking advantage of the very long and continuous light curve to observe this source, this shows uh, actually flaring activity with two flares lasting about a few kiloseconds where the intensity increases by a factor between 10 to 30 in both the soft and the hard X-ray band, which is combined with a uh, corresponding change in the uh, shape of the spectrum. So this combined with the fact that uh, we could find a total dynamic range of the source to be about 1000 conferred, it confirmed it to be a supergiant fast X-ray transient. So these are uh, very elusive objects um, where uh, the wind of the supergiant is believed to be clumpy. And when the neutron star, for example, accretes such a clump, this gives rise to these flares that we see in the X-ray band. Uh, very few have pulsations known, but for this object, we could actually confirm the pulsation of the object. And this further allowed us to probe uh, this uh, scenario of supergiant fast X transient, where uh, the neutron star is believed to be strongly magnetized and slow rotating, which also keeps uh, the, it in the propeller region most of the time, where the matter is actually propelled out and not allowed uh, into the magnetosphere from where it can accrete. So uh, using the information of the spin period and the X-ray spectrum, we confirmed that the magnetic field of the neutron star is at least uh, or more than 10 power 13 Gauss, which is very good agreement with the scenario. Uh, also for the SMC, uh, we uh, observed uh, the target supernova remnant 1E0102, and this is a very, very uh, uh, abundant region with high mass X-ray binaries that we see here marked in green and white. The black, uh, the white always it the our sources where pulsations are detected. So some highlight results for this was a discovery of pulsations uh, from one such candidate at 164 seconds. Um, and this confirmed this nature as a V X-ray binary pulsar. We also uh, identified the orbital period of the system using long-term optical uh, light curves at about 22 days. Then uh, since this field has a lot of known X-ray pulsars, we could actually uh, trace the spin evolution and see uh, how the spin period was uh, is today and whether it has spun up or spun down from its previous reported value. And this could answer important questions if the high mass extra binaries are uh, spinning near its equilibrium period. Um, are the slow rotators actually highly magnetized neutron stars? And can these high uh, spin up and spin down magnitude be explained by retrograde and prograde oppression? Andre, five minutes left. Uh, so we see here uh, two pulsars, uh, which was very uh, uh, rapidly uh, spinning up, and this is very rapidly spinning down with almost the same magnitude. So this is a signature that retrograde accretion might be an important uh, phenomenon here. So I would show just a few glimpses of the highlights we have from the uh, first All-Sky survey, where we see the Magellanic 
clouds here. And in fact, just to show that before the all sky survey, this was what we saw of the Magellanic system with a view uh, with almost no coverage in the bridge and the LMC and the SMC here. And of course, uh, with ERAS one, we had the full Magellanic system covered for the first time. And we already have a lot of exciting discoveries in this re regard. So just to show a full extent of the LMC uh, with very known uh, classical sources, we have uh, black hole X-ray binaries, uh, highly accreting neutron star X-ray binaries, classical super soft sources, etc. And the advantage of LMC is that because it is close to the south ecliptic pole, uh, it enjoys very frequent uh, coverage and high exposures. And this can allow us, for example, to probe long-term variability of the sources. For example, we see this neutron star X-ray binary, LMCX4, how uh, it was variable between the first three all sky surveys. And I show here a few highlights we have from the ERAS one, we had discovery of pulsations from two new high mass X-ray binaries confirmed their nature. We also discovered a rare class of B white dwarf candidate. Uh, we discovered outburst from a known B X-ray binary pulsar. Then uh, the bridge region, as I said is, uh, said, is very less explored. And we are uh, just now beginning to cover, uh, uncover new objects here. And uh, this was a very recent discovery of a new X-ray transient discovered with Erosita, where we see that uh, the source has brightened by more than a factor of 10 uh, between ERAS 1 and 3. And this has been followed up uh, with NICER and XLM Newton. And a very exciting results are on the way. So uh, what are the key questions that we hope to answer in the next few years? Uh, we um, hope to uh, provide a complete, the first complete and systematic studies of the high mass X-ray binary, super soft sources and supernova remnant population in the entire Magellanic system. Um, the high observation cadence uh, in the, this region, as I showed, will allow the study of long-term variability and will allow us to probe the physics of accretion and the role of magnetic fields and uh, the winds of the companion star in this regard. Uh, we will also explore the relation between high mass X-ray binaries uh, correlated with the spatially resolved star formation histories and systematically explore differences between the stellar contents of these clouds. And uh, we hope to uncover more of these BE white dwarf uh, binaries, um, which uh, are uh, expected to be much more numerous according to population synthesis models, but we only know a handful in this regard until date. And of course, uh, serendipitous science and rare discoveries. And we already have many more uh, exciting results in this regard. So I stop here and thank you for listening. Thank you, Chandra. So perfect timing. We have time for a few questions. Um, please raise your hands in the reactions box. Maybe I can start with one. Um, you, you you have not mentioned, or maybe you did and I missed it, sorry, that um, the population of uh, AGN, which are in the background of the cloud, that of course, uh, uh, with X-rays, you quite easily detect. And um, is there something one can uh, use this population for uh, to, to learn about the properties of the cloud? Is it something you, you have thought about? Yes, sure. I mean, this is a very interesting and very vast topic in itself. I did not mention it actually uh, here uh, due to lack of time, but uh, in the X-ray sources, we believe that more than 70% that we see are actually AGN behind the Magellanic clouds. And we identify them using optical and infrared colors mainly and then when we have candidates uh, we follow it up uh, with optical spectroscopy to confirm their nature redshift etc and uh, the brightest of these sources of course can be used to uh, probe uh, for example the absorption within the clouds so uh, yeah this is a very interesting uh, study in this regard and also because uh, of the high cadence of the magellanic clouds uh, we can study long-term variability in agents as well uh, of these objects. It, it just following that up, if I may, uh, I, I still don't see any other question. Um, 
you mentioned the issue of identifying the sources, right, with their counterparts. Um, for your work on the uh, mass and low mass X-ray binary population, um, how much of a limitation is the um, the positional accuracy of Irosita in this crowded stellar field? So, how confident typically you are about the identification of the counterparts? Do you need to rely on on uh, you know, Chandra and XMM, or uh, what, what methods do you use to, uh, to assess the reliability of this association? Uh, for the high mass extra binary, um, I would say crowding is not much of an issue. It's more for um, uh, identifying AGNs, uh, because this is more contaminated with star forming galaxies in the uh, faint end of the population. But the uh, early type stars are bright objects with optical magnitudes between um, 11 to 14 and uh, if you have uh, within the error circle uh, star with this magnitude this is a confirmed discovery so with high mass extra binary we are quite good at mm -hmm. okay thank you we may have time for one more question if you have but if we don't, thanks Chandri again, and we can move to the last speaker of this special session, Dr. Gabriele Ponti from INAF Merate. And uh, Gabriele will tell us about the X-ray view of galactic outflows from XMM to Irosita. Thanks a lot for giving me the uh, possibility to present these works. And uh, yes, I'm uh, actually willing to present the uh, XMM view and then the outstanding view by Erosita that we obtained over the past uh, year or so. So the main reason why I think this science topic is interesting is because uh, I think one of the major uh, questions in current uh, astrophysics is uh, uh, to try to understand how galaxies form and they evolve. Indeed, we know galaxies since more than a century and we've been imaging trillions of them, but still uh, we don't understand exactly how they form and they evolve. And the information that we accumulated over the past uh, decade or so is telling us that most of the activity is happening in the, uh, in the disk of the galaxy, but this is influencing uh, stuff that is above and below the galaxy. And uh, in order to understand galaxy evolution, we actually need to understand the physics of this plasma, which is above and below the galaxy itself. So here in this schematic view, you see the galaxy, the spiral uh, right in the center. And you see lots of, lots of uh, um, uh, plasma and activity happening above and below the galaxy. And this plasma is called the circumgalactic medium. And from theory, we think that uh, this plasma has been shock heated uh, to temperature of the order of 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 Kelvin uh, early in the formation of the universe. And being so hot uh, nowadays uh, uh, is expected to emit in X-rays and actually to contain uh, the bulk of the baryons uh, of the galaxy itself. And uh, basically, because the cooling time of this plasma is comparable to the Hubble time, it is via the slow recondensation of this plasma that we think that the galaxy is uh, growing. And the information that we accumulated over the past decade is suggesting that the activity in the center and in the disk of galaxy can drive outflows that are hot. And so they are replenishing this uh, circumgalactic medium with fresh material like particles, energy, and metals. And so basically to understand the galaxy evolution, I believe that we need to understand this cycle of, uh, of uh, baryons going from the disk of the galaxy uh, to the circumgalactic medium and back again to the, to the galaxy itself. And actually over the past decade, uh, lots of uh, uh, work has been done and lots of progress has been done uh, in studying active galactic nuclei and star bars. And there we are starting to talk about feedback processes where uh, the activity in the center, like the active galactic nucleus is driving either outflows uh, in the form of uh, uh, winds or jet that have a very strong influence on uh, the circumgalactic medium. And the starburst, in particular, the spe high specific star formation rate at the center of starburst is driving outflows that then again have a very strong uh, influence on the circumgalactic medium. And so uh, we, we talk about uh, um, feedback. And this is, of course, outstanding progress. But I would like to point out, out that AGN and Starburst are just a minor component of the all galaxies that we know are in part of the universe. 
And so I think one of the outstanding question is uh, in order to understand how galaxy evolve is to understand whether uh, the activity in the center, in the disk of galaxies, normal galaxies do influence their circumgalactic medium. And this is of course uh, the majority of the galaxies. So this uh, is, uh, I believe an important question. And in order to try to understand this, I think the best place to start uh, is to look at our own Milky Way because is, we are in it and so it's easier to see it at high resolution. So this is a schematic view of uh, what we think is uh, uh, appearing in our galaxy as loop from uh, the galactic pole. And we see the spiral arms and in the center there is a, a bar of stars and is actually this bar is dominating the gravitational potential there. And uh, so this means that the material that is, so the gas that is in the center is actually peculiar uh, shapes and uh, most of the gas is concentrated within the central hundred parsec. And so this is what I typically call the, uh, the galactic center. And uh, we have been imaging this galactic center in X-rays. So uh, here is the uh, galactic plane uh, and we see here about a few hundred parsec around Sagittarius a star, which is located here in the center. And uh, this uh, uh, region contains lots of uh, uh, neutral material, which is forming stars. Uh, and these stars are then producing explosion and energy releases. And I trace here in X-rays uh, uh, with the silicon, sulfur and argon lines, uh, uh, the hot plasma, which is then bright in these uh, uh, soft X-ray emission lines. And you see here uh, lots of diffuse emission and uh, uh, it's possible actually to, to trace and study the emission from all these uh, diffuse components. And what we did uh, is uh, to make an atlas of all the uh, supernova remnant in the region. And this allowed us to estimate the supernova rate in the region. And so to estimate the kinetic energy input due to supernova explosion or any explosion that is happening at the galactic center within uh, these central molecular zones. So within these uh, 100 parsec, uh, from Sagittarius a star. And the result is actually quite interesting because uh, the total uh, energy input into the region is of the order of 10 to the 40 Earth per second. And so this then is so high that would drive outflows from this region. And actually this realization came more or less at the same time uh, to the uh, discovery of enhanced soft X-ray uh, plasma, which is emitting uh, with a temperature of about 1 kV, a few tens of parsec above Sagittarius star. And we initially, when we saw this result, we were puzzled and we thought this plasma should not be there. We were not expecting this plasma to be there. So uh, we published it, uh, but immediately after we started wondering what is the origin for this plasma. And so we asked for a large XMM survey in order to cover this entire region. And this is the result. So you can see that uh, with this uh, deeper and larger uh, survey of this region, we confirm the presence of this plasma. We see that there is an edge on the Western side and on the Eastern side to the emission of this plasma. And actually looking at the data, the picture that was emerging was uh, of a molecular inflow through the disk, which, one, which was then producing a, a outflow on the pole, so toward the North from Sagittarius star. And this outflow would be of hot X-ray emitting plasma. But this uh, um, idea, this uh, model would then imply that there is an outflow only on one side of the galaxy, which would be strange. So even before publishing this idea and this data, we asked for a second scan toward the south. And then we discovered not only the northern chimney, but also the southern chimney, which are a channel that is connecting the activity at the galactic center within the central few parsecs all the way to the base of the Fermi bubbles. And this channel is uh, as long as a few hundred parsecs. So of course, I mean, in addition to the possibility to do beautiful uh, images, it's also possible to extract spectra. And here I'm gonna show spectra taken at different galactic latitudes through the chimneys. And as you can see, at every galactic latitude, we can detect several uh, emission lines. And by the, um, uh, the, 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 the fitting and uh, the understanding of the uh, various component, uh, we can uh, uh, measure from uh, these uh, emission lines, the temperature, the density, and the pressure of the plasma. And here I report the surface brightness, the density, and the pressure 
uh, as a function of distance from Sagittarius A star along the chimneys. So in black is toward north and in red is toward south. And what you can see here is that within the central 10 to 30 parsec, there is a very strong drop in surface brightness, density, and pressure. And this, is, this drop is consistent with an adiabatically expanding outflow from the region in the close vicinity to Sagittarius A star. And then if you look, for example, at the pressure gradient, you see that toward uh, 30 to 100 parsec, then the, the drop in pressure is becoming milder. So this is suggesting that the outflow is then becoming milder through the chimneys. And we don't see an end to this outflow. And it's actually, we see that this outflow is entering on larger scale features that are the base of the Fermi bubbles. And uh, the main point here I want to make is that with data like this, it's possible to have a clear understanding that features like the chimneys can have an impact on the circumgalactic medium. And by study, uh, detailed study of this spectra, it's possible to understand the flow of hot baryons uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this region. And we were very pleased to see that uh, six months after the publication of our discovery of the uh, X-ray chimneys, uh, actually the Meerkat team observed the features that are very similar to the, uh, the chimneys that we see in, uh, in X-rays, but this time in radio. And so basically the, uh, the chimneys, which are the galactic outflow, uh, have also a radio counterpart. And uh, let's put these uh, results in context. So let's zoom out from this region. We see that we have been imaging a tiny, a small region of a few square degrees at the galactic center. And when we look at the scale of tens of uh, degrees, then we see in the Rosat map, the X-ray counterpart of the Fermi bubbles. And if we zoom further out and we look in the gamma ray, then we see the uh, Fermi bubbles in their full glory. And uh, when we obtained these results was uh, actually, I think one on one and a half years before the launch of Eurozeta. And at that time we were dreaming about what was gonna uh, be possible once Eurozeta was, uh, uh, was gonna be available. Indeed, whatever I showed up to now is just confined to this tiny region of the galactic center. But with the launch of Eurozeta, then one could do similar studies, not just confined to this tiny region, but to the entire uh, sky. And so one could start probing the flow of baryons, not just to this uh, small region at the center, but to the entire sky. And these are the first results of Erosita. This outstanding image, uh, I think, is just speaking by itself. So it's an amazing result. And uh, as soon as the Erosita team started putting together this uh, uh, these, uh, amazing image, we started discussing it. And, um, we saw that this uh, North Polar Spur, which was known already before, actually doesn't stop at this region, but it seems to continue uh, all the way to the uh, Western side. And it seems that there is a hint of similar feature to the South. And so then we did the selection in energy, which are slightly different. So here I show the map uh, between uh, 0.6 to 1 kV. And now we see much more clearly the emission from this uh, feature. And uh, we see that these uh, feature, which is the North Polar Spur, which was known already before, is actually not stopping here, but is actually part of a bubble, which is uh, uh, connecting uh, uh, the uh, Eastern side to the Western side. And that on the Southern um, uh, sky, there is uh, uh, a similar component, which is slightly weaker, but is completely symmetric compared to the Northern one. And the symmetry suggests that actually the origin of these two Erosita bubbles is actually at the galactic center. And uh, this actually opens a, a question that I will address later and uh, is related to the nature of this component, which is the North Polar Spur, because if this North Polar Spur is then part of these uh, uh, Erosita bubbles, then it would be placed at the galactic center. So the first question was the discovery of the Rosita bubble. The second question is, uh, what is uh, the X-ray plasma doing within the Rosita bubble? Is the X-ray plasma volume filling or is it shock heated? And in order to try to answer to this question, we made uh, um, profiles of the emissivity of uh, the X-ray emission through the bubbles at different galactic latitudes. And you can see here in red the data uh, as a function. So this is surface brightness as a function of galactic longitude. And uh, if uh, the X-ray plasma would be volume filling, then you would expect to see a peak at the center of the bubbles. 
And uh, if it would be a very thin shell at the edge of the bubbles, then you would see these uh, green uh, values here, which are really thin, uh, so very peaky um, emission in, in, uh, uh, when projected in galactic longitude. And actually, the data are more or less between the two scenarios. And they seem to suggest that they are more or less consistent with uh, a relatively thick shell. So it means uh, a shell of several kiloparsec uh, in, in, uh, uh, in depth. The second question that we asked is uh, uh, the connection between the Fermi bubbles and the Rosita bubbles. And here in this plot, I'm showing the uh, Rosita bubbles in uh, uh, cyan and uh, the uh, gamma ray uh, emission uh, in, uh, in red. And as you can see, the Fermi bubbles are right in the middle of the Rosita bubbles. And uh, there seems to be a connection between the two. Um, but uh, the, uh, the connection is not trivial up to now. And uh, there is still the question whether uh, the Fermi bubbles and the Rosita bubble are actually two different manifestations of the same outflow or whether these two represent two distinct events. And we hope uh, that uh, soon we will be able to answer to this question. Uh, but this is still work in progress. What is clear, so despite there are things that we don't understand, uh, there are things that we do understand uh, and uh, uh, that are clear. And the first clear measurement is that the Rosita bubble are uh, bigger than the Fermi ones. Uh, uh, the morphology and the symmetry suggest that the Erosita bubble are at the galactic center. And uh, so this then, uh, given the brightness that we observe, uh, is giving us a thermal energy within the bubbles, which is of the order of 10 to the 56 ergs. And this is a very high number. Indeed, this number is a factor of 10 higher than the Fermi bubbles. And indeed, also the scale of the Erosita bubbles is a factor of 10 larger than the Fermi bubbles. And it's so large is we talk about uh, uh, tens of kiloparsec scale. So they are as large as the entire galaxy, the entire disk of the galaxy. So they are, I think, a very important contribution. And I think is uh, obvious from uh, these uh, early results that uh, uh, the Erosita bubbles have a strong, uh, and the outflow that is creating the Erosita bubbles uh, has a strong impact on the circumgalactic medium. Gabriele, four minutes left. Thanks. So uh, other, another question that was uh, uh, posed uh, is how are these Erosita bubbles peculiar? I mean, is our galaxy peculiar having these very peculiar bubbles or is this something which is common to many other galaxies? And so the team of Pilepich and collaborator looked at the cosmological simulations uh, in TNG and look at uh, uh, galaxies which are similar to the Milky Way. And here you can see 30 of them. And you can see that uh, uh, so basically the result is that most galaxies actually possess uh, uh, X-ray bubbles, which are very similar to the one uh, observed by the Rosita. And so their conclusion and their prediction is that Rosita bubbles should be common in, uh, in most galaxies. The second point that I think is interesting is to try to understand how these bubbles are plugged into the disk. So this is a result by Lockman Lock in collaboration who is showing the H1 uh, disk of the galaxy. And they were observing several years before the discovery of the Rosita bubbles uh, that the H1 disk in the central 20 degrees of the galaxy is uh, much thinner than uh, in the rest of the galaxy. And they were trying to understand whether this is associated to some sort of outflow. But at that time, the only evidence for outflow that was uh, available was the uh, Fermi bubbles. But as you can see, this could explain part of it, but they are smaller than the uh, real extent of the thin H1 plasma. And so very recently, Sofu and Kataoke um, placed our uh, Erosita map on top of this H1 disk. And they show that actually the connection uh, uh, between the two is very uh, remarkable. And, uh, and so that it could actually be that is, this uh, outflow that is forming the Rosita bubbles uh, is actually uh, the, the reason for, for uh, producing this uh, thin H1 disk uh, in the center of our galaxy. And I would like to remind you that right in the center, there are the chimneys. So they proposed a model where there is a bipolar hypershell and that uh, uh, what we see in X-rays is actually uh, the shock heated plasma as we were uh, mentioning before and that uh, the pressure of the outflow is actually confining the 
uh, center of the disk to a very thin extent, so a, a, a thin disk in, in the center. And so then the last question I would like to, um, uh, to pose uh, is regarding the location of the North Polar Spur. This is a long standing question, and these actually date back. So the first question was posed back in the uh, 60s, 70s, really at the early days of the X ray astronomy. And uh, back then, already there was a discussion is this the North Polar Spur uh, something which is within 100 parsecs from the sun, or is it something at the galactic center? And there are a series of uh, evidence in favor of uh, a local uh, um, feature and others that are uh, in, uh, in favor of the galactic center interpretation. And actually the fact that the North Polar Spur is uh, within the Rosita bubbles made us uh, think that actually the, also the North Polar Spur is at the galactic center. Um, and uh, I mean, this is, I think, still an open question. And in particular, I would like to stress a work that came out uh, last week on AstroPH uh, by Pana, uh, Panopulo, uh, a collaborator that put together the Fermi uh, data, synchrotron uh, data in green here, and the X-ray data in, uh, seen in blue by Rosa. And they point out the correlation between the North Polar Spur and Loop 1 and they say that there is very strong evidence that the um, part of loop one, which is further uh, north, uh, must be within 100 parsecs from the sun. But they also point out, and I think this is a very fair point, that both features, loop one and the North Polar Spur, are really big features on the sky. And so they propose the idea that I, I actually like it a lot, uh, that suggests that there, is, there are two components, two, two features that are distinct. One is loop one, and the other is the uh, X-ray uh, bubbles as seen by Erosita. And that because they are so big in the sky, there is a non-negligible uh, probability that they are actually partially overlapping in projection. So, here are my conclusion. We were discussing at the beginning the importance to study outflows and feedback phenomena in normal galaxies uh, in order to understand how galaxies grow and the influence between the uh, activity in the galaxy and the circumgalactic medium. And I think the Erosita bubbles are the manifestation of such outflow in our own galaxy. And uh, we have the hope that with uh, further analysis of the Rosita data, we will also be able to uh, start to tackle the following question that uh, relates on how the activity in the disk of the galaxy is exchanging information with the circumgalactic medium and back. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Gabriele. Very exciting uh, results and perfect timing. So we do have uh, a few minutes before our sessions end for questions to Gabriele. You can raise your hand in the reactions box. Well, while you think I can start from uh, with one, Gabriele, at the beginning when you were describing the um, uh, supernova remnants energetics that you measure from your XMM galactic center image, you give an estimate of that, yes, that uh, kinetic energy input. And I was uh, wondering um, whether you have an idea over which time scale this input is, uh, I mean, this number is relevant for which time scale and how this number connect with the global energy of the bubbles that you you, you quoted uh, in the end of your talk from so the this bubbles. this uh, energetic uh, is valid for the typical uh, uh, time for which uh, a supernova remnant is visible in x-rays so is of the order of 10 to the 4 years maybe few times 10 to the 4 years so these uh, uh, kinetic energy input uh, is uh, average over the past, uh, I don't know, several, few, uh, 10 to the 4 years. Um, we know that currently uh, the um, central molecular zone is forming stars at a rate which is uh, uh, lower than what would be expected uh, from the amount of material that is present there and is about a factor of 10 lower. And uh, 
there is uh, um, suggestions that actually there are cycles within the central molecular zone and that the star formation rate is going uh, uh, with cycles of a few million years uh, up and down by a factor of yeah maybe 10 or uh, even 100. And there are simulations of these made by Armillotta and uh, Sormani. And uh, this is mainly due to the fact that the, uh, the presence of the bar that I was discussing at the beginning and the way uh, this is uh, um, bringing material into the central molecular zone. And if one is taking the uh, this estimate of 10 to the 40, then uh, it would probably be uh, maybe not enough to explain uh, the uh, Erosita bubble. But if one is believing that uh, in the past uh, few million of, of years, uh, the star formation rate was uh, higher than what we uh, observe here as energy uh, input and, uh, and supernova rate, then uh, I think it would be possible to explain the Rosita bubbles with uh, uh, star formation. Okay, thank you. There are other questions for Gabriele? Well, okay, I do have another one, uh, in fact, connected with the issue of star formations versus AGN uh, energy source for these bubbles. Um, in the Pillepitch uh, paper that you mentioned that talk about the ubiquity of these features, uh, where does the energy come from for these bubbles? Is it AGN or star formation? Not that this is a proof really of anything, but... Uh, so, I mean, uh, so, so the, the title of the Pillepitch paper is um, um, AGN. So the, the Rosita bubbles are AGN driven. Okay. Very clear. <laughs> <laughs> so for sure, a short, uh, even a few million years long uh, episode of uh, a AGN activity, which is, doesn't even need to be extreme at the Eddington limit, but just simple AGN activity, then would be able to do these, uh, uh, these bubbles. Yeah. The main difference between uh, uh, star formation inflated and AGN activity is then the age of the bubble, because uh, in an EGN event, then the outflow can be faster and then uh, the, um, it's more energetic. So then the, uh, the bubbles would be younger compared to the uh, star formation scenario. Yeah. I cannot help but noticing they have chosen, uh, not by chance, <laughs> a color scheme to <laughs> make the even stronger. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it was very convenient indeed. <laughs> Good. Um, I don't see any other question. And now we reach uh, 1230. So I really want to thank uh, Gabriele and all the speakers of this session. As I said before, this session has been recorded. So at some point, I hope uh, it will appear somewhere. So we should keep an eye on that and maybe also let us, uh, our colleagues and friends, know about uh, this, what I think was a very, very good and interesting session. So thank again for all the speakers and the uh, audience and I will then close this session here. Thank you very much. Thank you.